So in this question, we're told that the table below shows corresponding values of x and y for this equation here. So for y is equal to the square root of x over 1 plus x. So that's what we have there. And we're told that the values of y are given to four significant figures. So we can see we have a table here and we've got all these values for x here. And then we have our y values, which are all to four significant figures. So what are we asked to do in this question? So we're asked to use the trapezium rule with all the values of y, which are given in our table. And we are asked to find an estimate for the integral from 0 0.5 to 2.5 of the square root of x over 1 plus x. We're integrating with respect to x and we're asked to give our answer to three significant figures. So we first recall what is the trapezium rule. So we know that this is going to be given by this formula here. So let us have the general case where we're integrating f of x with respect to x from x naught all the way to x n. Then we know we can use the following formula. So we know that it's going to be a half multiplied by h, which we'll come back to later. We'll explain what h is. And then we're going to multiply this by y naught plus y n. And then we're going to add on all of the other y values added up. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at our situation and see what our y naught is, our y n, y2, and so on and so forth, as well as h. So what I've done is I've copied the table down here. And what we can say is we know that this value here is going to be x naught, and we have x1, x2, x3, and finally x4. And similarly for our y's, we'll have y naught, y1, y2, y3, and y of 4. So in our case, we have that n is equal to 4. So now we're going to say what is h. So we know that h is going to be the difference between each x. So therefore, we'll just write that down. H is the difference between each x. So therefore, in our case, we have that we go from 0 0.5 to 1 to 1.5, 1.5 to 2, and 2 to 2.5. So we can see here that this is going to be 0 0.5, and then here, 0 0.5. So therefore, we can say our value of H is going to equal a half. So it's going to equal 0 0.5. So now we have all the information we need to substitute our values into this formula here to work out our integral. So therefore, taking the next step, we can say, therefore, our integral from 0 0.5 to 2.5, and what's the, the integral of? So we have x divided by 1 plus x. We square root that, and this is with respect to x. So we know this is going to be equal to. So we have 1 half, then we multiply by h. Well, what's h? We have 0 0.5. And then we're going to put in our big brackets. And then we're going to have y naught plus y of n. So in our case, we're going to have this value here, 0 0.5774. And then our y of n is y4 here, which is 0 0.8452. So we'll here we will have 0 0.5774. And we're going to add to that 0 0.8452. Then we're going to add on two lots of this value and this value and this value. So writing that down, we have 0 0.7071. Then we're going to add on 0 0.7746. And then finally, we're going to add on our y3 value, which is 0 0.8165. So therefore, we'll close our brackets. And we can just kind of digest what we've done there. So we've taken the values after we've identified them from the table and we substitute them into our formula. So then what we can do is we can take our calculator and put all of these values in. So therefore, just uh, we make sure to be careful putting all the significant figures in, etc. And this comes out to be 1.50475. Now there's some further decimal places. So therefore, in the question, we were asked to round to three significant figures. So just write a little concluding statement from, we have our integral, which goes from 0 0.5 to 2.5, and, and it's going to be of x divided by 1 plus x. We square root that, and differentiate with respect to x. So the estimate, so we'll do the approximation symbol. We're asked to round to three significant figures. So this is going to be 
1.50. And there we have our three significant figures and we've completed the question. So this question was worth three marks and we receive our first mark for identifying that our value of h was 0 0.5. We then receive our second mark for substituting our values into the formula correctly and we receive the third and final mark for concluding with the correct answer. So now in part B of this question, we're asked to use our answer to part A, which I've copied down here, to deduce an estimate for this integral here. So this is the integral of 9x over 1 plus x and we square root all of that and we integrate with respect to x with limits being from 0 0.5 to 2.5. So we have to have a look, what do we have in part A and what do we have in part B? And how can we move from this estimate to an estimate for this? So one thing we notice, the only difference here, is that we have the coefficient in front of the x, we have a 9. Whereas we have 1 here, we have a 9 in this. But we know if we're integrating a constant, we can take it out of our integral. So what we can say, this is going to be equivalent to 2 and a half, 0 0.5, and then we can go the square root of 9 multiplied by x divided by 1 plus x. And we have our square root there still and integrate with respect to x. And what we can do, since this root 9 is a constant, we can take it out. So I'll just write in here, this is a constant, so we can move it out the integral. So therefore, we have that this is going to be equal to... So we have the square root of 9 coming outside the integral, which is going to be equal to 3. and then our integral remains the same. So it's going to be 0 0.5, 2.5, and then we have x divided by 1 plus x, and then we take the square root of that and integrate with respect to x. But what do we notice now? This integral here, this is exactly the same as we had in part a. So what does this mean? So this means that we have now 3 in front of our integral. So therefore, we know that this is going to be the same estimate as our answer from part a, and to get our estimate for this, we're just going to multiply it by 3. So therefore, writing this out, we have that the integral from 0 0.5 to 2.5 of 9x over 1 plus x. And we're integrating with respect to x. So this is going to be approximately equal to 3 lots of our answer from part a, which was 1.50. And this is going to be equal to... 4.50. So therefore, we've shown that the estimate of this integral here is 4.50. This question here is worth one mark, and we received one mark for having the correct answer. So in the next part of this question, we're told that the integral we're dealing with in part b, so the integral of the square root of 9x over 1 plus x, integrated with respect to x from 0.5 to 2.5, is equal to 4.535, and that's to four significant figures. And we are asked to comment on the accuracy of our answer in part B. So we recall our estimate from part B. So remember, this was an estimate using the trapezium rule. And we had that this was 4.50. So what we can see here, we have a real value of 4.535 and an estimated value of 4. 0 0.50. So from this, we can make the conclusion that we have an accurate estimate. Why is this? This is going to be because our estimate is very similar to our actual answer. So just writing it down, we can say that the accuracy of the answer in part B, we can say it's high. And why is this? This is because, so since we have that 4.50 is approximately equal to 4.535. So basically, the difference just comes from the fact that we've used different significant figures to round it. So therefore, we'll just annotate it in here. This is the estimate, and we have that this is the real value. So therefore, we pick up one mark in this question, and that's for having this comparison when we say that the accuracy of our answer is good, it's high. And why is that? It's because our estimate is approximately equal to our real value. And therefore, we've completed this question. So here in this question, we're told that relative to a fixed origin, the points P, Q and R have position vectors P, Q and R respectively. Now we're given two key pieces of information. We're told that P, Q and R lie on a straight line and we're told that Q lies one third of the way from P to R. So 
what we're asked to do here, we're asked to show that the position vector Q is equal to 1 over 3 lots of R plus 2P. And this question is for three marks. So we can see we have our straight line here. So what we're going to do to start is we're going to annotate this, which is going to help us understand the question and help us make a plan of what to do to solve this question. So we know that PQ and R line is a straight line. So we can first put in P and R. So we know that this is going to be P here. So that's P. And then if we let this point in the line here be R. So that's P and R. And then we're told that Q lies one third of the way from P to R. So we have P, we have R, and we now can have a look and see where Q lies. So we know it lies one third of the way from P to R, so that'll be about right here. So we'll just annotate that in here. This diagram isn't to scale, but it's good to have us have an understanding of what's going on in the question. So that's point Q there. And what we're going to do is we can say that the vector QR, so we're right down here, the vector qr so like this what's it going to be equal to well it is going to be equal to two thirds of the vector pr because we know that qr is to here and then this lies one third of the way along from p so therefore qr is equal to two thirds of the vector pr and then our knowledge of position vectors, we can say that this is going to be equal to, so the vector qr, how do we work that out? It is going to be the position vector r minus the position vector q, and that's going to be equal to two-thirds of the vector pr, and that in terms of position vectors is going to be the position vector r minus the position vector p. So now what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange this and solve for the position vector q, as this is what the question asks us to do. So what we'll do is we'll multiply our brackets on the right hand side and we'll therefore have that R minus Q is going to be equal to two thirds of R. Then we're going to subtract two thirds of P. So remember, we want to rearrange for Q. So we'll just highlight this here. And how are we going to do this? So we want to basically add Q to both sides to make it positive and then we'll subtract two-thirds R and add on two-thirds of P to the other side. So this leaves us with the fact that Q is going to be equal to, so our R stays on that side, and then we're going to subtract two-thirds of the position vector R, and then we add on two-thirds of the position vector P. So then tidying this up, what can we do? So we have two R terms here. So we'll have 1 minus 2 over 3, which is equal to 1 over 3. So we have 1 over 3 lots of R. And then we're going to add on 2 thirds of P. And looking back at the question, we take out a common factor of a third. And we see that we're nearly there. And if we take out a common factor of a third here, that is going to leave us with the required answer. So therefore, we have that Q is going to be equal to, so we have 1 over 3. And then we know that's going to leave us with R. And then to get from 1 over 3 to 2 over 3, we multiply by 2. So therefore, we add on 2 lots of the position vector P. And then we look back at the question, what were we aiming for? So we're aiming for Q is equal to 1 over 3, R plus 2P. Does that match what we have? Yes, it does. So we write in Q. So we write in as required. So this question, like I said, was worth 3 marks. We receive our first mark for attempting the relevant vector by subtracting either way around. So we receive our first mark at this point here, and we then receive our second mark for having it in the form where we expand the brackets and begin to rearrange. And we then receive our third and final mark for concluding with the correct answer. And that was that Q was equal to one third lot of R plus two P. And that was the answer which we required. So in this question, we're given that 2 log of 4 minus x is equal to log of x plus 8. And we are asked to show that this is equivalent to the following. So that x squared minus 9x plus 8 is equal to 0. And we're asked to do this for three marks. So here we've copied down our expression. And effectively, what we want to do here is we want to get this into a position where we have two log expressions and we can then compare what's inside each bracket. But we can see that this is an issue at the minute because we have a two in front here. So what we want to do is we need to have a think about is there any log laws we know which could be useful 
to help us get rid of this too. So there is, we have the power law. So we know that if we have a multiplied by log of b, that is gonna be equivalent to saying log of b to the power of a. So we can bring the power up to here. So for our situation, what does this mean? This means our two here can become a bracket up here. So this then leaves us with log of four minus x, and then we put our brackets in and we bring our two up. So our two becomes the exponent here. And then that is still gonna be equal to log of x plus eight. So then I've written down this kind of second piece of information here, which is if we have log of a and that is equal to log of b, then a is gonna equal b. So that's what we have now. So that means that we can say that four minus x squared is gonna be equal to x plus eight. So therefore, we'll write that down, we'll have four minus x all squared is gonna be equal to x plus eight. So now we just need to expand these brackets on the left hand side and rearrange to see if we can try and show this expression here. So expanding our brackets, we'll have four multiplied by four, which is 16. And then we'll have two lots of negative four x. So that is gonna be negative four x, negative four x, which is negative eight x. And then x multiplied by x, that is gonna leave us with a positive x squared. And that is equal to x plus eight. Then the next step for us is gonna be to try and make one side, so this side equal to zero. So that's gonna leave us with, so we'll have our x squared remains unchanged. We're then gonna have negative eight x, and then we'll subtract x from both sides. So that is gonna be negative nine x. And then we have 16 on the left hand side. We want to get rid of the eight here. So we'll subtract eight from both sides. So that leaves us with positive eight. We've just cleared this right hand side. So that means this expression here is equal to zero. So is this what we're after? X squared minus nine X plus eight is equal to zero. And we're asked to show that X squared minus nine X plus eight is equal to zero. So therefore we write in as required. And therefore we've completed this part of the question. Like I said, this was worth three marks. And where do we receive our first mark? Well, we receive it for using this power log law. So from going from here to here, so we pick this up at this stage here. We then receive our second mark for eliminating the logs to form a quadratic equation in X. So that was at this stage here, we received our second mark. And we then, and we then receive our third and final mark for concluding with the correct answer. And how did we do that? We did that by expanding our brackets and rearranging, and then that left us with the required answer. So now in part B of the question, we're gonna look at the first part. We're asked to write down the roots of the equation x squared minus nine x plus eight is equal to zero. So we need to have a think, how do we find the roots of an equation? So we need to have a look here and see, we need to find two numbers which are factors of eight, but they sum to minus nine. So just writing this down here, we want the numbers to multiply to positive eight, but add to negative nine. So what are the contenders? So we know we here are gonna have two negatives because the only way we can get a negative nine is by having one negative and adding another negative. And we know when we multiply two negatives, we'll get a positive. So therefore, the one that sticks out to me is gonna be negative eight and negative one because negative eight times negative one is equal to eight and negative eight, negative one is equal to negative nine. So therefore we can factorize our equation and we'll have x minus eight and we'll have x minus one is equal to zero. So therefore we can say that x is equal to one and x is equal to eight. And that's us completed the question where x is equal to one, x equal to eight, that is our roots. So I'll just annotate this in and say, these are our roots. Then in the second part of part B of this question, we're asked to state which, if any roots from part B1, is not a solution of our log equation. So that was two log four minus X is equal to log of X plus eight. So just having a quick look at this, we know this whole question is only worth two marks. So there's only really one mark for this part here. So we're not gonna have to do a whole lot of work, but we know we have our equation here. And we know that anything inside this log bracket here it must be greater than zero. So we know when x is equal to eight, that we're gonna have 
not that here. So we're going to have log of 4 minus 8, which is log of negative 4. And we know that's not possible. So therefore, we can say that for x equal to 8, what will our expression be? So we'll have, on that left-hand side, we'll have 2 log of 4 minus x. That is going to be equal to 2 log of 4 minus 8, which is going to be equal to 2 log of negative 4. But because we know this inside the bracket must be greater than 0, we know that this can't be found. So just annotate that in. So we'll say that log of a is only valid for a greater than 0. So therefore, just concluding, we can then say that hence x equals 8 is not valid since 2 log of negative 4 cannot be found. So just taking a look back, this question in total was worth 2 marks and received our first mark in part 1 of question B. We received it for just concluding that the roots were 1 and 8. So we get our 1 mark for having those two roots correct there. And then in part 2 of question B, we receive 1 mark for just basically stating that 8 is not a solution because the log term can't be found. So we receive our 1 mark just here for that statement. And that's us complete this question. So in this question, we're told that in the binomial expansion of a plus 2x to the power of 7, the coefficient of x to the power of 4 is equal to 15,120. And what we're asked to do is find the value of a. So generally speaking, if we want to find the kth term of x plus y to the power of n, we're going to use this formula here, where we have n choose k, and we're going to multiply that by x to the power of k, and then multiply by y to the power of n minus k. So for our case, how are we going to do this? So we want to find the fourth term. So therefore, we're going to have 7 choose 4 like that. So then what are we going to have? So for our x term, it is going to be x to the power of 4. So we'll have our x term, which is 2x. We're going to have it to the power of 4. And then we're going to have a to the power of 7 minus 4, which is 3. So then basically what we're asked to do, we know this, and we're going to use this to help us work out the coefficient. So we know that this is going to be numerical. We want to work out a, which is going to be numerical. And the only thing in this part here that is not numerical is going to be the x. So therefore, we can say that 7 choose 4. And if we multiply this by 2 to the power of 4 and multiply this by a to the power of 3, this is going to be what? make what this is going to be the makeup of our coefficient which is going to be equal to 15,120. So if we put this into our calculator here so 7 choose 4 multiplied by 2 to the power of 4 that is going to be equal to 560. So we have 560a cubed is going to be equal to 15,120 so therefore what we want to do we're wanting to solve for a so we'll have the a cubed is going to be equal to 15,120, and we're going to divide that by 560. So therefore, we can work out what a is. So we can get rid of our cubed there and take the cubed root of this fraction here. And we put this into our calculator, and this comes out as 3. So therefore, we can conclude that a is going to be equal to 3. And that's us completed this question. So like I said at the start, this question was worth three marks and received our first mark for having an expression like this. So that was when we kind of acknowledged what was going on and was us beginning to work out the correct coefficient of x to the power of four. We then received our second mark for working out this and getting an expression in terms of a cubed. So we'll give ourselves that mark just about here. And then we receive our third and final mark for concluding with the correct answer, which was that a was equal to 3. So in this question, we're told the curve with equation y is equal to 3 multiplied by 2 to the power of x meets the curve with equation y is equal to 15 minus 2 to the power of x plus 1 at the point p. And we're asked to use algebra to find the exact x coordinate of p. So what we want to do here is find the point of intersection between this equation and this equation. So how are we going to do that? 
Well, we're going to equate these two equations and then use algebra to solve for x. So therefore, we have 3 multiplied by 2 of x. That is going to be equal to 15. And then we subtract 2 to the power of x plus 1. So we need to now think of a strategy where we can work through this to solve for x. So our first step, which we're going to do, is we're going to take this term here. So our 2 to the power of x plus 1. So we'll just put a star here and we'll work on this at the side. So we know that 2 to the power of x plus 1 is going to be equal to 2 to the power of x multiplied by 2 to the power of 1, which is equal to just kind of writing it out fully there so we can see how the, the exponent rule works. So this is actually equal to 2 to the power of x multiplied by 2. So we can substitute this back in. So we'll therefore have that 3 multiplied by 2 to the power of x is going to be equal to 15 minus 2x multiplied by 2. So what we want to do is we want to continue working with this and solve for x. So we know that we're going to have to do something to do in logarithms and lns and exponentials because we need to get our x down from here to being kind of in the normal position, if you like. So the question is, how are we going to do this? So if we divide both sides by 2 to the power of x, we'll get rid of it here and here and then just have one term here. So just writing that down, we have, so we'll divide by 2 to the power of x, so we'll have 3 is going to be equal to 15. Then we divide that by 2 to the power of x, then we have this term here, the 2 to the power of x cancels out, and that leaves us with negative 2. So just write in here, what do we do? We divided by 2 to the power of x on both sides. And now what can we do? Well, we can take this 2 and get rid of it by adding 2 to both sides. So this is going to leave us with 5 is equal to 15 divided by 2 to the power of x. So then if we multiply both sides by 2 to the power of x, we'll then have 2 to the power of x multiplied by 5 is equal to 15. And if we then divide both sides by 5, we'll then get 2 to the power of x on its own. So this gives us 2 to the power of x is going to be equal to 15 divided by 5. So therefore, what's this going to be equal to? Well, we'll then have that 2 to the power of x is going to be equal to 15 divided by 5, which is 3. So we've got to this stage here. This is a good, a good stage. So we have our x term here. So we need to have a think, what can we do to isolate this x term on its own? So we need to effectively get rid of this 2 and bring the x term down. So if we take the ln or ln of both sides, we'll have ln 2 to the power of x, and that's going to be equal to ln of 3. So we'll just annotate in here. To go from here to here, we took in ln of both sides. And then we need to have a think, is there anything we know? So we know we have log laws. And if we have the power rule, so we know if we have ln a to the power of b, then that is equivalent to saying b multiplied by ln a. So what happens is our exponent here comes down to here. So we can apply this in our case here. So what does this leave us with? We can bring x, our power, down to in front of the ln. So we'll have x multiplied by ln of 2 and that's going to be equal to ln of 3. So now we have our x here almost isolated on its own, and we can divide both sides by ln of 2, which will get us to our final answer. So we have that x is going to be equal to ln of 3, and we divide that by ln of 2. And therefore, we've found x, and that is the exact coordinate of p. So just annotate in here that we divide both sides by ln of 2. So then what is this x value? This is going to be the x coordinate of p. So therefore, we have completed this question. Taking a look back at it, it was worth four marks. So we pick up our first mark at the stage where we knew to equate the two terms. So that was at this point here. So that was kind of having the initial strategy right and working through it. So we then receive our second mark for beginning and working through with the algebra to get to the stage where we had 2 to the power of x was equal to 3. So that's where we picked up our second mark. 
We then pick up a third mark for then using logarithms. In our case, we've used ln and for getting that into the stage where we had an expression for x. And then we pick up our fourth and final mark for having this expression correctly. So we'll annotate in here that we've picked up two marks at this stage here. And we've picked up one mark for correct working. And then we get our other mark for correct answer. And that's where our one, two, and then third and fourth marks were available on this question. So in this question, we're told that we have x squared plus 8x minus 3 over x plus 2. And that is equivalent to ax plus b plus c over x plus 2. And we're told that x is a real number, which is not equal to negative 2. And we're asked to find the values of the constants a, b, and c. So in this question, for, which is for three marks, we're basically being asked to do partial fractions. But we're already given the first step. So we're told that we have this expression here. And um, what are we going to do here? So if we multiply both sides by x plus 2, let's see where that gets us. So that's going to be our first step. And from there, we can substitute in values which we'll specifically pick out, which are going to help us solve for a, b, and c. So if we multiply everything by x plus 2, we'll have x squared, then we'll add on 8x, and then we'll take away 3, and that is going to be equivalent to ax, and then we multiply that by x plus 2, and then we're going to add on b, and we multiply it by x plus 2, put our brackets in, and then we have, if we multiply this term, c over x plus 2 by x plus 2, that's going to leave us with just c. So the next thing we're going to do is have a look and pick our first value. So if we were to make x equal to negative 2, we can substitute that in here. And then if we substitute in here, it will give us this whole term 0, and it will give us this whole term is equal to 0, which will leave us with our value c. So if I just write down let x equal negative 2, then we'll have negative 2 squared, and we'll add on 8 lots of negative 2, and we'll subtract 3. And now we use equal signs, so that's going to be equal to, so then we'll have a lots of negative 2 multiplied by negative 2 plus 2. And rather, then we add on b lots of negative 2 plus 2, and then we add on c. So we can see here that our left-hand side it is going to be equal to negative 15. So we'll have that negative 15 is going to be equal to well, this is 0 and this is 0, so it's equal to c. So therefore, we've worked out what c is. And then our next stage, we're going to let x equal another value. So we now know one piece more of information. We know what c is equal to. So if we let x equal 0, this is going to rule this term out, but not this term, which then means we have all the values here and all the values here, so we can work out what b is. So if we let x be equal to 0, then we'll have on the left-hand side, we'll have negative 3, because if we substitute 0 into here, that'll be 0, that'll be 0, and this is just negative 3. And what's that going to be equal to this time? So we've just said we have a 0 here, so that cancels all this term out. And then we put 0 in here, that leaves us with 2b. And then we add on c, and what was c? It was negative 15. So therefore, we add 15 to both sides, and we have that 12 is going to be equal to 2b. We then divide both sides by 2, and that gives us that b is going to be equal to 6. And then finally, now we know what b is, and we know what c is, we can pick any value other than the ones we've picked already, which will help us to work out what a is. So we're going to pick a slightly simple one. So we're going to pick x being equal to 1. So we'll let x be equal to 1. Then what are we going to have? So we're going to have x squared. So we'll have 1 plus 8 minus 3. What's that going to be equal to? That's going to be equal to 6. So we'll have that 6 is going to be equal to a lots of 3. So that's 3a. And then we're going to add on b, which is 6, multiplied by 3 since that's what happens when we have 1 plus 2, and then we know c is still negative 15. So therefore, what does this leave us with? And this leaves us with 6 is going to be equal to 3a plus 3, because we have our 6 multiplied by 3, which is 18, then we subtract 15, which gives us 
3. And then rearranging this, we take away 3 from both sides, and this leaves us with 3 is equal to 3a. So therefore, dividing both sides by 3, we have that a is going to be equal to 1. So therefore, we can just write our little conclusion here. We can say that a is going to be equal to 1, b is equal to 6, and finally, c is equal to negative 15. So we'll just underline our answer there, and that's us completed this question. So I said earlier this question was worth 3 marks. And we receive our first mark for multiplying by x plus 2 and having a correct method to attempt to find the values for a, b, and c. So we'll give ourselves this mark at this stage here. This was kind of where we, we showed that we knew what we were doing and knew how to kind of begin work on the question. We then get our second mark for, uh, this is now kind of concerning our answer, we get our second mark for having two answers correct and then we get our third and final mark for having all the answers correct so therefore i'll put that we got our two marks in here and we'll just annotate it one mark for two correct and then we got one mark for all three correct and obviously if you have all three correct you get the one mark for having two correct and the one mark for having three correct and that gives us three marks in total. So then taking a look at part B of this question, we're asked to use algebraic integration to find the exact value of the integral of x squared plus 8x minus 3 divided by x plus 2. And we're integrating with respect to x with limits from 0 to 6. And we're asked to give our answer in a specific form. And that is a plus b lin 2, where a and b are both integers which we're to find. This is for four marks and when you you know when you first look at a question you can see especially in this one there's a clue here it says hence so when a question says hence this means that we need to use something that we've done in the previous part of the question so this expression here it was equivalent to the expression which we found when we found the values for a b and c so we know that then if the expressions are equivalent, then the integral of the expressions are equivalent. So therefore, what we can do is we can write our integral in here. So we'll have six and zero, and then we'll just move this up ever so slightly, and we'll add in dx, and then we know we'll add in our integral here, six, zero, and we'll integrate with respect to x. So that's the first stage. And the second stage is just to integrate. So we'll just do this at the side, just to start. So we know what does x integrate to? x with respect to x is going to integrate to, well, we add 1 to the power, and then we divide by the new power. And then we know the integral of 6 will be now 6x. And then finally, the integral of 15 over x plus 2 integrated with respect to x. So we have 1 over something, so we're going to have 15 then we multiply that by the integral of 1 over x plus 2, which we know is going to be lin of x plus 2. So there we go. So that's us completed our integrals. So then what we can do, we can say that, therefore, carrying our equals down, that this is going to be equal to, so we'll have x squared over 2, then we're going to add on 6x, and then we have our subtract here, so we're going to subtract 15 lots of lin of x plus 2. So we've not yet put in our limits and evaluated them, so we'll put our square brackets in here, and the limits are 6 and 0. So we now need to have a think about our limits, so we can therefore say, what's this going to be equal to? So we'll have 6 squared over 2 plus 6 lots of 6. Then we're going to subtract negative 15 lots of ln of 6 plus 2, which is 8. And then we put big brackets around this, and then we're going to subtract our second limit. And we see that when we put 0 in here and 0 in here, those terms will be 0. So that's going to leave us with negative 15 lin of 2. So then simplifying the left-hand side here, we'll have 36 over 2, which is 18. And then we're going to add on 6 times 6, which is 36. And then we'll subtract 15 lin of 8. And then... We'll get rid of the big bracket, so we take away negative 15 lin 2, so that's going to be the same as adding 15 lin of 2. And 
then what we can do now is simplify this further. So we know that this is going to be equal to 18 plus 36, which is 54. Now we have two lin terms. We have one which is in terms of lin of 8 and one which is lin of 2. And we recall a question, we were asked to give our answer in the form a plus b lin 2. So this means we want to get our expression into something to do with lin 2. So we need to have a think, what can we do? We know that lin of 8, what can we rewrite it as? So we know we have the power law. So that means, is there any power which would have us here to get it into the form lin 2? So we know that lin 2 to the power of 3 is going to be equal to lin of 8. And why is that? That's because 2 to the power of 3 is equal to 8. Then what can we do? We can bring our power down and place it in front. So this is also going to be equal to 3 multiplied by lin of 2. So then we'll just note in here this is the power log law. So then what does this leave us with? This leaves us with negative 15. Then we multiply that by 3 lin of 2. And then we add on 15 lin of 2. So then this is going to be equal to 54. And then we have negative 15 multiplied by 3, which is negative 45. And then we add 15 lin 2. And then combining all this, this is going to leave us with negative 30 lin of 2. So then we look, think we then we think back to the question. We were asked to give our answer in the form a plus b lin 2. Have we done this? So we have our lin 2, we have a and b which are constants. So therefore, we can underline that and we can say that a is equal to 54, b is equal to negative 30, and finally, that's us. So we've completed this question and worked out the constants which were asked for. So like I said at the start, this question was worth four marks. And we receive our first mark for knowing how to and correctly integrating our expression which was negative 15 over x plus 2 to get something in terms of ln so we'll give ourselves that mark here we'll just annotate it so that was for integrating 15 over x plus 2 so that was where we achieved our first mark and then we receive our second mark for having the fully correct integration so this was a correct integration so that was specifically looking at the x squared over 2 and the 6x terms there. We then receive our third mark for substituting in both limits and then uh, kind of starting off with the algebra. So we'll give ourselves this mark here. So that's where we picked up our third mark. And then we receive our fourth and final mark for having the correct answer, which was 54 minus 30 lin 2. And that's us completed this question. So here in this question, we're shown figure one, and it's a sketch of the curve C, which has the equation y is equal to 4x squared plus x divided by 2 multiplied by the square root of x. Then we subtract negative 4 lin of x, and this is valid for x greater than 0. So we can see our parabola-like shape here, and we notice we have a point here which looks as if it is a turning point of this function. So in part A of this question, we're asked to show that dy by dx, so the derivative of y with respect to x, is going to be equal to 12x squared plus x minus 16 root x, all divided by 4x multiplied by root x. So how are we going to do this? So we're being asked to find dy by dx, so we need to differentiate this. And we can see that effectively we have two parts of this equation. We have this part here, and then we have this part here. So we can kind of split these up and do these separately and then bring them back together at the end. So we're first going to take a look at our log differentiation here. So we know that if we are differentiating ln of x, its derivative is going to be 1 over x multiplied by, well, in this case, we have this constant in front. So we'll just write that down. So our first step is going to be the derivative, so d by dx of 4 over lin x. So we want to find the derivative of this. What's it going to be equal to? Well, it's going to be equal to 4, and then we multiply that by our standard derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x. So then that will leave us with 4 over x. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a box around this and highlight it, as this is a very 
important piece of information which we want to come back to later when we get to our final answer. So now we want to differentiate this part. So we have a fraction and we know that when we want to differentiate something to do with a fraction, we're going to use the quotient rule. So the quotient rule says that if we have, say, a function h of x, which is equal to something over something else, so let the numerator be f of x and let the denominator be g of x, and then we can find the derivative of h of x by using this formula here. So we have the derivative of f of x multiplied by g of x, and then we subtract f of x and multiply it by the derivative of g of x, and then we divide everything by g of x, so that's our denominator squared. So how are we going to do this? So we've got our function here. So we can say, so we're going to say let h of x be equal to 4x squared plus x, and then we divide that by 2 multiplied by the square root of x. So therefore, we can now select functions f of x and g of x. So we'll have the f of x is going to be equal to our numerator, which is 4x squared plus x. And then we have the g of x is going to be our denominator, which is 2 lots of root x. So now we want to differentiate these. So we can therefore say differentiating f of x. What's this going to be? So we'll have 4x squared. We know we want to multiply by the power and then take one away from the power. So we'll have 4 multiplied by 2, which is 8. And then we'll have x to the power of 2 minus 1, which is 1. And then we have x on its own here, so that'll differentiate to 1. So we'll have that that is 8x plus 1. So now we're taking a look at g of x. What's its derivative going to be? So we know that 2 multiplied by root x is equal to 2x to the power of a half. So we know we can now differentiate this because we want to multiply by the power, which gives us a constant of 1 at the front. And then we're going to take one away from the power, so it's going to be x to the power of negative a half. What's that equal to? Well, that is equal to taking our exponential down. That's going to be equal to 1 over the square root of x. So then we can use the quotient rule, and we can say that the derivative of h of x is going to be as follows. So we just take our new terms we have here and substitute them in in this fashion here. So we start off with f dash x, so we'll have 8x plus 1, and then we multiply that by 2 root x, and then we're going to subtract f of x, which is 4x squared plus x, and we're going to multiply that by 1 over root x, and then we don't forget that we need to divide by g of x squared, which is 2 multiplied by root x squared. So now all that's left for us to do is to take our term here and our term here and we kind of merge them together to give us dy by dx but firstly to make things slightly easier later we're going to just simplify this h of x derivative here so this is going to be slightly tedious but we're just going to work through it slowly so multiplying out that first bracket we have 8x multiplied by 2 root x so that's going to be equal to 16 then we have x to the power of 3 over 2. So our next term, it's going to be 2 root x multiplied by 1. So we're just going to write root x in terms of that's kind of in this. So we'll have that, that that's going to be 2x to the power of a half. And it'll become clear why we don't write root x and why we're writing 3 over 2 and 1 over 2, etc. As we'll see that things start to kind of cancel out uh, in a second. And then we're going to subtract. So we'll have 4x squared multiplied by 1 over root x. So 4x squared and then multiply by 1 over the square root of x. So then we have x to the power of a half. And then our final term is going to be x over x to the power of a half. And then we can simplify our denominator slightly here. So it's going to be 4x. So that's what we get when we square 2 root x. So for us next, what we can do is we can just tidy these two terms up here. So we'll have that this remains as 16x to the power of 3 over 2 plus 2x to the power of a half. And then simplifying 4x squared over x to the power of a half. So we can then take our x components together and do 2 take away a half, which is going to be 3 over 2. 
So I'll have negative 4x to the power of 3 over 2. Mm, doing similar for the final one, we'll have 1 minus a half since we are dividing. And that is going to be x to the power of a half. And then, once again, our denominator remains the same at 4x. So now we notice we have x to the power of 3 over 2 and x to the power of 3 over 2. And x to the power of a half and x to the power of a half. So what we can do is we can start to simplify things. So therefore, just rewriting this, we we'll have h of x. So combining our 3 over 2 terms, we have 16 minus 4. So that's going to leave us with 12x to the power of 3 over 2. And then we have two lots of x to the power of a half. Take away one lot of x to the power of a half. So that is going to leave us with positive x to the power of a half. And we don't forget to divide by 4x. So then our next step is to divide each individual numerator term by 4x. And then this is going to leave us with, so 12 divided by 4, that is going to be 3. And we're going to have x to the power of 3 over 2 divided by x. So that's going to be 3 over 2 minus 1, which is going to be a half. And then similarly for the second part, it is going to leave us with 1 over 4 x to the power of a half. And now we can swap back in our kind of square root signs as if it's always going to be neater. Then we multiply that by the square root of x and we add on 1 over 4 root x. So we now have the derivative of h of x and then we need to remember back to our previous part where we had 4 over x. And now we can combine these to find what dy by dx. So what I'll do just for consistency is I will circle this box here and highlight it again in yellow. So we know that these are the two parts that we need to bring together to find dy by dx. So therefore, we can conclude that dy by dx is going to be equal to, so we're going to have 3 root x plus 1 over 4 root x. And then looking back at the question, we had that we were subtracting 4 lin of x. So this means we're now, for the derivative, going to be subtracting 4 over x. So just writing that in here, we then subtract 4 over x. And then remember what we're aiming for on the question. So we have this fraction here. So we nearly have that. And we can get to that by multiplying kind of these terms here to get us a single fraction. So how are we going to do this? So we can use the kiss and smile technique and multiply the first two terms together. So we'll have 3 root x multiplied by 4 root x. And that is going to give us 12x. And then the other part, that's over 1. So we'll have 1 times 1, so plus 1. And then what's its denominator going to be? It is going to be 1 multiplied by 4 root x. And we still have our negative 4 over x there. And then once again, we can just use the kiss and smile technique again. So we have x multiplied by 12x plus 1. So that's going to be 12x squared plus x. And then our other side, we're going to have negative 4 multiplied by 4 root x. So that's going to be negative 16 root x. And then our denominator, what's it going to be? So it's going to be then the two denominators multiplied together, which is going to be 4 lots of x multiply by root x. So therefore, we'll just kind of look back at the question and see if that's what we're aiming for. So we were asked to show that dy by dx was equal to 12x squared plus x minus 16 root x divided by 4x root x. And that is what we have here. So we'll just write in here. So we've got our answer there and then we'll go that's equal to dy by dx as required. So this question was worth four marks. So we pick up our first mark for knowing how to differentiate the ln term. So that's when we got to four over x at this stage here. We then received our second mark for having a method to differentiate four x squared plus x over two root x. So the method we used was the quotient rule. So we'll give ourselves the second mark when we kind of knew what to do, knew the formula and started working through this. We then received our third mark for starting to make progress with the quotient rule and substituting the values into the formula. So we'll give ourselves our third mark at this point here. 
and then we receive our fourth and final mark for getting to the correct answer and concluding that dy by dx was 12x squared plus x minus 16 root x divided by 4x multiplied by root x. And that's us completed this part of the question. So in part B of this question, we're told some further information which relates to the graph. We're told that the point P, which I already mentioned, is the minimum turning point on C. And we're asked to show that the x coordinate of P is a solution of x is equal to 4 over 3 minus root x over 12, all to the power of 2 over 3. So when we're asked a question about minimum turning points, we instantly think dy by dx is going to be equal to 0. And that's because we know that we can find the stationary points by setting dy by dx equal to 0. And we know that a minimum turning point is a type of stationary point. So the first step here is going to be to set dy by dx equal to 0. So I'll just note that down. Our first step is to set dy by dx equal to 0. So we recall from part A of this question that the answer we were required to show was this. And this is good that this was a show that question part A, because in your calculations, if you didn't get the right answer or you didn't manage to complete the question, but you do know how to do part B, it's good that you can just take the derivative which you're given to then proceed with this part of the question. So therefore we take this derivative and we set it equal to zero. And what we now need to do is to rearrange this into this form here. So our first step is gonna to be to multiply everything by this denominator, because we know if we multiply both sides by this, it's gonna get rid of it because it's equal to zero. So this is going to leave us with 12x squared plus x. And then we're going to subtract 16 root x. And this is all still equal to 0. So now the strategy for us is going to be to, like I said, get this into this sort of form here. But we can't factorize because we have this kind of not normal term. We would normally to factorize need 12x squared plus x minus 16. But we have this square root of x here. So we can get rid of this as a first step by dividing everything by the square root of x. So this is going to leave us with 12x over the square root of x, which is going to be equal to 12x to the power of 2 minus a half, which is 3 over 2. Then we're going to add on, what's that going to be? That's going to be 1 minus a half, which is a half, so still root x, and then take away 16 and that still remains equal to zero. So then now what we want to do, we know that this is a term that we're looking for and it is to the power of two over three. So we know that on this side, that before we took the two thirds root, this was gonna be x to the power of three over two. So this means we want to solve for this term here. So we're gonna to start to rearrange. So we're gonna have 12x to the power of three over two and that's isolating that term on that side. Then we add 16 to both sides and subtract the square root of x. So therefore, now what we want to do, we can take one step further to isolate this x term by dividing both sides by 12. So I'll just note that down here, divide both sides by 12. So that's going to leave us with, well, we'll have 16 over 12. And then we're going to subtract the square root of x divided by 12 also. So then the next step here is going to be just to simplify this right hand side. So we'll keep the x to the power of 3 over 2. We know that 16 over 12 can be simplified to 4 over 3. And then our root x over 12 remains the same. So then all that's left for us to do finally is to now take the 2 thirds root of both sides. And that is going to leave us with x on its own. And then we have 4 over 3 minus the square root of x over 12. And we pop our brackets in and take it to the power of 2 over 3. And then looking back at the question, this is what we were asked to show. So we've shown that x is equal to 4 over 3, take away root x over 12 to the power of 2 over 3. So we'll just write in here as required. And therefore we've completed it. This question was worth 3 marks. And we pick up our first mark for knowing to set the derivative equal to zero and getting to the stage where we had then divided both sides by the square root of x. So that was at this stage here where we had 12x to the power of 3 over 2. 
plus root x minus 16. We then receive our second mark for beginning to rearrange and knowing to do this. So we'll give ourselves this mark when we had 12x to the power of 3 over 2 on its own there. So that was shown we kind of we knew the process that we had to carry out. And then finally, we'll then get our third mark when we got to the required answer, 4 over 3 minus root x over 12, all to the power of 2 over 3. And that's us completed part B of this question. So now in part C of this question, we're asked to use the iteration formula, which is given here. So we're told that the n plus 1 term of x is equal to 4 over 3, take away the square root of the nth term of x, divided by 12, all to the power of 2 over 3. And we're told that the initial value, so x1, is equal to 2. And we're asked two separate questions here. So we're first asked to find the value of x2 to five decimal places. And then we're also asked to find the x coordinate of p to five decimal places. So to find x2, what we can do is we can use the value of x1 that we're given and substitute it into this formula here. So I'll just draw an arrow here just to highlight what we're going to do. So we're going to sub this in. So therefore, we can say that x2 is going to be equal to 4 over 3. Then we're going to subtract the square root of x1 over 12. And then we take all of that and put it to the power of 2 over 3. And then this time we sub in because we know the value of x1. So we're going to have 4 over 3 take away root 2 over 12 to the power of 2 over 3. So what we do is we take our calculator and plug this in. And this is going to give us 1.138935. 1 and so on. And recalling the question, we're asked to round to five decimal places. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we have the six decimal places of five. So we're going to round up. And that's going to leave us with 1.138935. And then we round up our 3 to a 4, and then we'll just put in here to 5 decimal places. So that's us complete part 1, and then for part 2, we're asked to find the x coordinate of p to 5 decimal places. So what we can do is we can take this iteration formula on our calculator, which we've just plugged in, and then we're going to, rather than then manually typing this number in, we can replace x of n, so in our case, we just use 2, we're going to replace that with answer. So you'll have a button on your calculator, ANS, and you're going to click ANS when the cursor is in the XN position. So then what you can do is just keep pressing equals and it'll keep updating it with this new answer. And then it'll get to the point where it converges and that number which it converges at will be the X coordinate of P. So therefore you do this in your calculator and this comes out as 1.15650. And that's us completed this question. There was three marks on offer, and we pick up our first mark for knowing to substitute our values into the equation here, and we then receive our second mark for working out what x2 was. So we'll give ourselves our second mark here, and that was to five decimal places, and we then receive our third mark in part C, for stating that this point was equal to, so we had that x was equal to 1.15650. And there we have completed this question. So here in this question for six marks, we're told that a curve C has the equation y is equal to f of x. We're given some further information. So we're told that the derivative of f of x, so f dash x, is equal to 6x squared plus ax minus 23. And we're told that this value a is a constant. We're told that the y-intercept of c, so this is our curve, it has value negative 12. And we're told that x plus 4 is a factor of f of x. And here, we're, what is the question asking us to do? We're asked to find f of x in its simplest form. So we write down here that we have f dash x is equal to 6x squared plus ax minus 23. So therefore, we know that we want to go from f dash x to f of x. So how are we going to do this? So we are going to integrate. So we can write here that f of x 
is going to be equal to the integral of the derivative of f of x, and that should be integrating with respect to x. So now what we can do is we can carry this out. So f of x is going to be equal to the integral of f dash x. So I'll just substitute that in. So from up here, we know that that was going to be 6 x squared plus 8x and then we're going to subtract 23 and we're integrating with respect to x. So then the next step for us is going to be to do the integration. So we'll just do that over here in purple. So the integral of 6x squared with respect to x. So how are we going to work this out? So we will add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So we're going to have 6x cubed over the new power which is 3 and then our next term we'll have the integral of a of x with respect to x so we don't know what a is but that doesn't matter so we're going to have add 1 to the power so a x squared divided by new power which is 2 and finally negative 23 integrated with respect to x is going to be equal to well we don't have any x at the moment so that means we'll now have x to the power of 1, so negative 23x. Then we can take these and substitute them back in to our original equation. And then we will add the constant c, which you may notice we've not added here, but since this is just scratch work, that's okay. But we'll now add the constant c when we write all of our terms down here. So continuing this on, we'll have then we can actually, before we substitute in, also simplify this. So we have 6 divided by 3, which is 2. So we can say that is 2x cubed, actually. So what we're going to have, going back down to substituting this in, we'll have 2x cubed. Then we're going to add on ax squared divided by 2. Then we're going to subtract 23x. And then we're going to add our constant of integration, c. So we'll just add that in, constant of integration. So what is this again? We'll just continue this down here. That's f of x. So we're now told we're going to use this second piece of information that we're given here. So we're told that the y-intercept of c is 12. So we know that the y-intercept is going to occur when the value of x is equal to 0. So therefore, what we can do is we can say for x equals 0, we're going to have the f of 0 is going to be equal to 2 lots of 0 cubed plus a multiplied by 0 squared divided by 2 minus 23 lots of 0 and then we're going to add on c and what is this going to be equal to so this is going to be equal to the value of the y-intercept so we know that f of 0 is going to be negative 12 so this is all equal to negative 12 and what's that? That's the y-intercept, so i.e. y when x is equal to 0. So then just kind of putting these values into our calculator, or we can even do it by just looking at it, we see this is going to be 0, this is going to be 0, and so is this. So therefore we have that c is going to be equal to minus 12. And this means we can now substitute this back into our expression. So we'll have that f of x is going to be equal to, so we'll have 2x cubed, plus ax squared over 2, so that over 2, and then we're going to subtract 23x, and now we have that c is negative 12, so we will subtract 12. So now what do we need to do? So this is starting to look, look good. We're looking to find f of x in its simplest form, so we're getting there. But there's one thing that we can still do. We can work out what this value of a is. So looking back at the information we're given, we have used that information to integrate. We have now used the y-intercept information, so we now need to use this here. So the fact that x plus 4 is a factor of f of x. So what does this mean? So just writing this down, if x plus 4 is a factor of f of x, then this means that f of negative 4 is going to be equal to 0. So in other words, negative 4 is a root. So what we can now do, we can use this information and do similar to what we've done here, but with substituting in f of negative 4. So therefore, we have that f of negative 4 is going to be equal to 0, 
which is going to be equal to, so we look at our equation here again, so we'll have two lots of negative 4, and we're going to cube that, and we're going to add in a multiplied by negative 4 squared, we divide that by 2, then we're going to subtract negative 23 multiplied by our value of x, which is negative 4, and then we add on our constant, which in our case is negative 12. So what we can do is we can put these values into our calculator, and we have that 0 is going to be equal to negative 128 plus 8 lots of a plus 80. So rearranging this, we can just tidy up this here and leave 8a on one side, and then we'll have negative 128 add 80, and then we'll add that to both sides, which leaves us with negative 48 here. So then we can solve this. So we can then say, therefore, a is going to be equal to negative 48, and we divide that by 8. And what's negative 48 over 8? That is going to be equal to negative 6. So therefore, what we can say is we can say that f of x is going to be equal to... So now what we're going to do is rewrite this expression here, but we've now found our value for a. So we're going to have 2x cubed, and then we're going to add on negative 6x squared over 2, which is going to be negative 3, because we have negative 6 divided by 2, then we have our x squared, and then after that we subtract 23x, and then we subtract 12, and that's a completed answer where we've shown f of x in its simplest form. So we have the f of x equal to 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 23x, take away 12. And that's us completed this question. So looking back, it was worth 6 marks. So we receive our first mark for knowing to integrate. So we receive that first mark at this stage here. We then receive our second mark for having the integration correct. So that was correctly integrating all of our terms and adding our constant of integration. So that was at this stage here, we received our second mark. We then receive our third mark for using the y-intercept information and concluding that our constant c was equal to negative 12. Then, moving on from here, we receive our fourth mark for knowing to use this fact that uh, x plus 4 is a factor, and then that means that f of negative 4 is equal to 0. And then substituting that in, so that's where we receive our fourth mark, just about here. We then receive our fifth mark for correctly working out the value of a. And then, just to finish things off, we receive our sixth and final mark for concluding with the correct answer, which we have here when we stated f of x in its simplest form. A quantity of ethanol was heated until it reached boiling point. We're told that the temperature of ethanol, which is denoted by theta and is measured in degrees C at time t seconds after heating began, is modelled by the following equation. So this equation says that we have theta is equal to a minus b multiplied by e to the power of negative 0 0.07 multiplied by t. And that's where a and b are positive constants. We're given two pieces of information here. We're told firstly that the initial temperature of the ethanol was 18 degrees C, and that after 10 seconds, the temperature of the ethanol was 44 degrees C. So we're asked to use this information to find a complete equation for the model. And we're told to give the values of a and b to three significant figures. So what do we want to do here? So essentially, we're given some information and we need to complete the equation. And when the question says complete the equation, what does this mean? So this means that we want to find the values of A and B. So find these constant values. So how are we going to do this? So our first step is going to be to set t equal to zero. And when t is equal to zero, we know that theta, so the temperature of the ethanol, is going to be equal to 18. So we have this from this first bullet point of information here. So therefore, this will give us the following equation. So we can substitute this in to this equation here. And we'll have that 18 is going to be equal to the constant a. And we take away the constant b multiplied by the exponential function to the power of negative 0 0.07 multiplied by 0. 
So then we can just tidy this up a little bit. We know that we have a minus b to the power of zero because this exponential power here is going to be zero. And we know what happens when we have um, e to the power of zero. So we'll just write this here. We have e to the power of zero is going to be equal to one. So therefore, this leaves us with the following equation. We have that 18 is equal to a minus b. So we'll now use the second bullet point of information. So we have that when t is equal to 10, we have that theta is going to be equal to 44. So this means we can just do the same again, and we can say that 44 is going to be equal to a minus b. Apart from this time, we're going to have something slightly different. We're going to have negative 0 0.07 multiplied by the time, which is 10. So what we're going to do is just shuffle along our decimal point by 1, and we'll have negative 0 0.7. So therefore, we now have two equations, and we have two constants, a and b. So we can now use our knowledge of simultaneous equations to solve for these constants. So we'll now rewrite them both in terms of b by making their subject equal to a. So for our first equation, which is this equation here, we'll have that a is going to be equal to b plus 18. We get that by adding b to both sides. And secondly, we have that a is going to be equal to, so we'll have b multiplied by e to the power of negative 0 0.7 then we add on 44. So this is our two equations. We can now set these equal to each other. So this part here and this part here, they're going to be equal. So we can therefore say that b plus 18 is going to be equal to b multiplied by the exponential to the power of negative 0 0.7 plus 44. So tidying this up a little bit, we can take our b's onto the same side. So we'll therefore have b, and then we subtract b lots of the exponential to the power of 0 0.7, and that is going to be equal to 44 take away 18, which is 26. And we must remember what we want to do here. We're solving for b. So we can therefore take a common factor, so we'll have the take b out, that's going to be 1 minus e to the power of negative 0 0.7, and that's equal to 26. We can now see that we're not far from isolating this b term, and we can do this by dividing both sides by what is in the brackets here. So therefore, we can say that b is going to be equal to 26. And we divide that by 1 minus e to the negative 0 0.7. And what we can do is we can put this into our calculator. And this comes out as 51.647 and so on. So therefore, like the question asked for, we're asked to uh, give these values to three significant figures. So we can say that b is going to be equal to 51.6. So now we've found out the value of b. This makes it relatively straightforward to work out the value of a. So what we'll do is we will take this equation here, so we'll just draw a down arrow here, and we can now say we know that b is equal to 51.6. So therefore we'll have that a is going to be equal to 51.6 plus 18, and what is this going to be equal to? This is going to be equal to 69.6. And we know that is equal to a. So now all that's left us to do is to take this original equation we had and to rewrite it but with our values of a and b. So we can therefore conclude that theta is going to be equal to our value of a, so 69.6, and then we subtract our value b, so 51.6, and then we have that that is multiplied by e to the power of negative 0 0.07, we multiply that by t. And that's us completed part a of this question. So looking back at this question, there was four marks available. We receive our first mark for knowing to use the information we were given and setting 
t equals to 0 and theta equals 18 and substituting this in so we receive our first mark here and we get that for either doing it with t equals 0 or t equals 10 and then we pick up our second mark at the point where we did both of these substitutions so we did t equals 0 and followed it through and t equals 10 and followed it through so we pick up our second mark just here we then pick up our third mark for calculating our first value of our constant so we received it when we calculated b so that was when we got that b was equal to 51.6 and we then received our fourth and final mark for following through to calculate our second constant and substituting it into our equation to have the final answer and that's us completed part a of this question so in part b of this question we're given some information about the boiling point of ethanol we're told that it has a boiling point of approximately 78 degrees c and we're asked to use this information to evaluate the model so what i've done here is i've copied down our model from part a so we can see here that we have 69.6 that was our constant which we found it was our constant a and then we have this value and we're always going to be taking away this part which is always going to leave us with in the end a theta which is less than 69.6 so this is where we run into an issue. So what does it tell us? This tells us that the maximum possible value of theta is going to be 69.6. And this is because this part here is always going to take away from 69.6. So just writing that down, we can say that the maximum temperature is going to be 69.6 degrees C according to the model. So then in practice, what does this mean? This means that the model isn't great and why is this this is because the maximum should be 78 because that is the boiling point of ethanol so therefore this is a fault in our model so we'll just write this down and we'll say that therefore the model is not appropriate and why is this this is because 69.6 is much lower than 78 so therefore this question is worth two marks receive our first mark for kind of looking at the model and identifying that the maximum value theta can take is 69.6 and then we receive our second mark for linking this to the you know the problem we have which is that the ethanol has a boiling point of approximately 78 degrees c and hence concluding that the model is not appropriate so we receive that second mark just on our second line of work here and that's us completed this question so in this question, we're asked to show that cos 3a is equivalent to 4 cos cubed a minus 3 cos a. So we start off and we'll work from our cos 3a and try and get to this right hand side. So to begin with, we'll take a look at the compound angle formula. So this tells us that cos of x plus y is going to be equal to cos x multiplied by cos y minus sin x multiplied by sine of y. At this point we don't yet have our equation in the form where we can do this but what we can do is we can split our 3a up into a, a 2a and a 1a so therefore writing this down we have cos of and then we'll put brackets in this time we'll have 2a and we're going to add on a so now what we can do we can use the compound angle formula with x equals to 2a and y equal to a so we can therefore write this in and we can say that cos 3 of a is going to be equal to, so we'll have cos of 2a multiplied by cos of a and then we're going to subtract sine of 2a multiplied by sine of a where we've just replaced x and y in this equation here uh, to give us our equation in terms of a which is what we're working with in this question. So now what we can do is we can use the double angle formula. So we notice we have a cos 2 of a here and a sine 2 of a here. And we can see here we have equations, the double angle formula, which gives expressions for these here. So we'll substitute these in. Uh, so we'll just carry down our equals here. And then we have that cos 3 of a is going to be equal to 2 cos squared of a minus 1 then we multiply all of that by cos of a and then we're going to subtract 
to sine a cos of a and we multiply that by our sine a here sine a so there we go so now we're ready to move on to the next stage and what we're going to do for this next stage is expand out our brackets so this first bracket will expand it out and multiply that term and multiply that term too so we'll have two and then we have a cos squared a multiplied by cos a so that's cos cubed of a and then we're going to subtract one minus cos of a which is cos of a and then looking at this second bracket here we're going to have negative that's our one term, so we just multiply it, and it's going to be 2 sine squared a multiplied by cos of a. So for the next stage, we note that in the question, uh, the right-hand side, which we are aiming for, everything is in terms of cos. But we see in our equation here, we still have this 2 sine squared a. So we know we also have the trig identity, sine squared x plus cos squared x is equal to 1. So we can rearrange this for sine squared x, and we can substitute this in for sine squared x here. So bear in mind we have 2 sine squared a, so we'll just therefore do this in the purple over to the side here, and we have that 2 sine squared x is going to be equal to, we multiply everything by 2, so 2 minus 2 cos squared of x. So we can then substitute this in to our equation over here. So this is going to leave us with 2 cos cubed of a minus cos of a so then we'll now substitute in our new part over here so we'll have we'll put our brackets in first and we'll have 2 minus 2 cos squared a and then multiply that by cos of a so then all that's left for us to do now is expand these brackets further so our first bit remains the same 2 cos cubed a minus cos of a then this time we're going to have minus 2 lots of cos of a and then we have take away the negative so we'll add on 2 lots of cos so we have squared a multiplied by a so that's cos cubed of a so then now we can combine these terms together so we know we have 2 cos cubed a and we have 2 cos cubed a and then we have cos of a and cos of a here so we can combine all of these like terms together which is going to leave us with the fact that cos 3 of a is equivalent to so we add our, our cube terms together so that's going to be 2 plus 2 which is 4 cos cubed a and then we have negative 2 minus 1 lots of cos of a so that's going to be negative 3 cos of a so we look back at the question and this is exactly what we were asked for we we're asked to show that cos 3 of a was equal to 4 cos cubed a minus 3 cos of a. So we've therefore completed this question. We see that this question is worth 4 marks and we receive our first mark for knowing to use the double angle formula and getting to this stage here where we had that cos 3 of a was equal to cos 2a multiplied by cos a minus sine 2a multiplied by sine a. We then receive our second mark for knowing to use the double angle formula and substituting this in. So this was at this point here, we got that. So we used the double angle formula here and here. And then thirdly, we receive our third mark for uh, knowing to use the third trig identity. So this was this part here. So we receive our third mark here, and then we receive our fourth and final mark for concluding with the correct answer which was cos 3 of a is equivalent to 4 cos cubed a minus 3 cos of a. So in this question, we're asked to solve for uh, x between negative 90 degrees and 180 degrees, the equation 1 minus cos 3 of x equal to sine squared x. So we have our equation here, and we know that if we want to solve something like this, we must have everything in the same form so that's either all the cosses or all the sines so for our case we're going to convert everything into cos so we know we have the trig identity sine squared x plus cos squared x is equal to one so what we can do is we can rearrange this for sine squared x which will give us that sine squared x is equal to one minus cos squared x so what we can do is write this in here so we'll therefore have that one minus cos 
3 of x is equal to 2. So we'll have, like I said, we'll rearrange this equation here. So that's going to give us 1 negative cos squared x. So we also have that this cos 3 of x term, well, we can use what we did in part a. So we have that cos 3 of a is going to be equal to 4 cos cubed a minus 3 cos of a. So this is exactly the same in this question, apart from we'll have x's instead of a's. So being careful with where we have our brackets because of this negative here, we're going to have 1 and then we subtract, we'll put our brackets, we'll put our brackets in there, we'll have 4 cos cubed of x and then we're going to subtract 3 cos of x. And we have still, that is going to be equal to 1 minus cos squared x. So what we can do is we can then uh, expand these brackets by multiplying by the negative and then taking the this side here over to this side and equating this to 0. So this will remain as 1, then we have minus 4 cos cubed of x. Then we're going to add on to that because the neg negative 1 multiplied by negative 3 cos x is going to be positive 3 cos x. And then we then subtract 1 and add cos squared x, which is equal to 0. And therefore, what we can do, continue over here, we can tidy this up a little bit. We can see our 1s here. We have a positive 1 and a negative 1. They'll cancel out. So that's going to leave us with cos squared x. And we're going to add on 3 cos x. And then our final term is going to be negative 4 cos cubed of x and we recall that this is all still equal to zero so we can now take out a common factor of cos x so bear in mind we're wanting to solve for x so the easiest way to do this is firstly take out cos of x and that is going to be then multiplied by cos x plus 3 and then we're going to subtract 4 cos squared x and that's all still equal to zero and then now what we can do is we can say let cos x equal y and we have the following quadratic inside the brackets here we will have negative 4y plus y plus 3 and then taking the negative out, we'll have negative lots of 4y minus y minus 3. And then what we see is that um, this will factorise into, so we keep the negative outside and we have 4y plus 3. And then we're going to multiply that by y minus 1. So what we can do is we can relate back to what we have here and we can... Firstly, we'll take out the negative and put the negative in front of here, but it doesn't really matter because we can multiply both sides by negative 1 anyway, so that will cancel out the negative because negative 0 is still 0. So then we'll therefore have as follows. We'll have cos of x and then multiply that by 4 lots of y plus 3. And remember that y was equal to cos of x, so 4 cos x plus 3. And then in our other bracket, we'll have cos of x minus 1. And that's all still equal to 0. So then what we can do now is we can start to solve the equation. So we'll have our first term here, cos of x. That's going to be equal to 0. And then secondly, we'll have that 4 cos of x plus 3 is equal to 0. And finally, we'll have that cos cos x minus 1 is equal to 0. So solving these with the calculator, we put in here, we have that x is going to be equal to cos negative 1 of 0, which comes back as 90 degrees. We have here that what we can do is we'll say that cos of x is equal to negative 3 over 4. So how do we get that? We subtract 3 from both sides and then divide by 4 to get this cos x on its own. And then putting this into the calculator, we get that x is equal to 138.59 and so on. 
which will round to 139 degrees. And then finally, we have here that uh, cos x is going to be equal to 1, and we get that by adding 1 to both sides. So putting that into our calculator, we have that x is going to be equal to 0. So in questions like this, we want to show all the solutions, and we need to look at our range to see how we do this. So we know that we're looking for x is between negative 90 and 180, and we know in a case like this we'll have a cast diagram. And for us here, what we're going to have is we tick the all box, since we have positives, and then we're going to tick the cos box as well. So first off, taking a look at x equals 90, we know that if we come back from 0 like this, we're going to have negative 90, which is in a range. So we have also that x is equal to negative 90. We see if we do the same with our other two options. Firstly, with x equals 0, 0 take away 0 is going to be 0. So that's a standalone solution. And then we see that if we subtract 139 from 0, it'll be out with our range. So therefore, we can write a concluding statement that uh, solutions are going to be x is equal to negative 90 degrees. And then we'll have the next solution is 0 degrees, 90 degrees, and finally 139 degrees. And therefore, we've completed this question. We recall looking back that it was worth four marks, and we'll now go through where we picked up those marks. So we pick up our first mark for getting it into the form where we had cos squared x plus 3 cos x minus 4 cos cubed x was equal to 0. So we picked up that mark at this stage here. We then picked up our second mark for then going through this process here where we separate our brackets and we pick the mark up for this line of work here where we set our different terms equal to 0. So we'll put our second mark in here. We then receive our third mark for having two of the four solutions. So we'll just pop that one in here. And then we receive our fourth and final mark for having all four solutions correctly. So we'll put our fourth mark in there. And that's us completed this question. So in this question, we're shown figure two, which we can see here. And it's a sketch of the graph with the equation y is equal to 2 multiplied by the absolute value of x plus 4, and we subtract 5 from that. And what we're asked to do in this question is where to find the coordinates of p. So we can see we have p here, which uh, almost looks as if it's our turning point, and it's safe to say it is our turning point. So just note that down, we have that p is our turning point. So we can read the turning point from the equation. So to do this, we swap the sign of the term next to the x, and then the remaining term is our y-coordinate. So we therefore have that x is equal to negative 4, and additionally we have that y is equal to negative 5. So therefore we can say that the coordinates of p are negative 4 and negative 5. There is two marks available here, and we receive our first mark for getting either the x or the y-coordinate, so we had our x-coordinate first, so we'll give ourselves our first mark here, and we receive our second mark for having the correct final answer. So in this part of the question, we're asked to solve the equation 3x plus 40 is equal to two lots of the absolute value of x plus 4, and then we subtract 5. So we're going to have two options here, depending on the absolute value. So we'll start off with option 1, and it's going to be that we have 3x plus 40, is equal to two lots of x plus four, and then we subtract five. So this is where we essentially have the positive part of the absolute value. And just sorting this equation out here, we'll tidy it up and solve for x. So we'll have on this side two x, and then we'll have two multiplied by four, which is eight, and we'll take away five from that, which leaves us with positive three, and therefore, this is going to leave us with subtracting 2x from both sides. We're going to have the x is going to be equal to, and we'll have 3, and we take away 40 from that. 
is equal to negative 37. So then to check if this solution is valid, we're going to substitute it back into our original equation here. So therefore, we have three lots of negative 37, and we're going to add 40 to that. And that should be equal to two lots of the absolute value of negative 37. Then we're going to add on four to that, and then we subtract five. So we put this into our calculator, and we have that this gives that negative 71 is equal to 61. But we see that that is not true. So therefore, from this, we can conclude that x equals negative 37 is not a valid solution. So then we're going to now take a look at option 2, and that is the case where we have that 3x plus 40 is going to be equal to negative 2 lots of x plus 4, and then we subtract 5 from that. So then tidying this up, we're going to have that 3x plus 40 is going to be equal to negative 2x, negative 8, and then we subtract 5 from that. And tidying this up, we add 2x to both sides, so we have that 5x is going to be equal to, so we have negative 13, and we subtract 40 from that, which gives us negative 53, and then we divide negative 53 by 5, which gives us negative 10.6. So then we therefore, we check the solution, and we're looking to see if it's going to be valid, and for x equals negative 10.6, we have substituting into this equation again, just like we did here. We have that 41 over 5 is equal to 41 over 5. We therefore conclude that the solution is x is equal to negative 10.6. And therefore, we've completed this question. And we'll now take a look at where we picked up our marks. So we pick up our first mark for attempting to solve the equation and reaching a value for x. So we receive this point here, and then we receive our second and final mark for concluding that this was a correct solution. And that's us completing this part of the question. So in part C of this question, we're now told some further information. We're told that a line L has the equation y is equal to a of x, where a is a constant. And we're told that L intersects our original equation, which is y is equal to two multiply by the absolute value of x plus 4, negative 5, at least once. And what we're asked to do is to find a range of possible values of a, and we're to write our answer in set notation. So we know we're going to have a line which at times will intersect with our equations. So for example, here it intersects twice, and here it intersects once. And also, for example, here it will intersect once. But we can see if we have a line here, we can see that it will not intersect. So we're now going to work out the points at which it intersects. So we need to have a think about when do we get a line which is going to be here. So we know that for y equals a of x, that is going to be a line through the origin which takes gradient of the value a. And we know that the gradient of this line here, which I'm highlighting, is going to be equal to 2 since we have a coefficient of 2 in front of our x term. So we know that when a equals 2, so for a equals 2, we're going to have a line that's going to be parallel to our point. So we'll draw on here, we're going to have a parallel line which passes through the origin, and we can see that that's never going to intersect. So for a equals 2, there will never be intersection. So therefore, if we increase this gradient, the line is going to become more vertical, and we see that there will be intersection. So we can therefore say, for a greater than 2, there will always be at least one point of intersection. And we need to think at what point does the line start to intersect when we go this way. So the point that this is going to be is going to be when we have something which intersects with the point P. So to find this, we're going to take y equals ax with point p, which we recall from the previous part of the question was negative 4, negative 5. So therefore we'll have that negative 5 is equal to negative 4a, 
and therefore we can see that a is going to be equal to 5 over 4, which is 1.25. So from here, this means that for a less than or equal to 1.25, there will be at least one point of intersection. So in writing this in set notation, we have that from negative infinity to 1.25 inclusive. So we have a square bracket here because it's 1.25 inclusive, and we don't include negative infinity in the interval, so we have a, an open interval like that. So we have that for that, and we know this is going to be in addition to for when we have a greater than 2. So that means that we can write this in, some, in set notation as the union of this with 2 all the way to infinity. And it's 2 but not inclusive of 2. So we have an open interval here. So we have a curly bracket like that. And therefore, we've written out the solution in set notation. So in this question, there was three marks available. We receive our first mark for making the point that a must be greater than 2. So we receive that here. And then receive our second mark for finding the part about a being less than or equal to 1.25. So we'll write that in here. And then we receive our third and final mark for writing about the set notation and having that answer correct. And therefore, we've completed this question. So here in this question, we're given figure three. And it is a curve which has parametric equations, x is equal to 6 sine t, and y is equal to 5 sine 2t. And we know that this is for values of t between 0 and pi over 2. We're shown that the region R, which is shown here shaded in figure 3, is bounded by the curve and the x-axis. In this question, we're asked to show that the area of R is given by the following integral. So we have from limits 0 to pi over 2, the integral 60 multiplied by sine t multiplied by cos squared t, and we're integrating with respect to t. So in a question like this, where we're presented with parametric equations, we're going to use the equation here. We're going to have that the shaded region r is equal to y is a function of x, and we integrate with respect to x with our limits in x. So another way we can write this is say that we'll now have limits t2 and t1, and we're going to have y, but this time it's going to be in terms of t, and then we're going to multiply that by dx by dt, and we're integrating by d of t. So what we're going to notice at the side here, we have that y of t is equal to, for our case, it's going to be equal to y, which is equal to 5 sine of 2t. And then we're going to have that x is equal to 6 sine t. So therefore, we differentiate this and we have that dx by dt is going to be equal to, so how do we differentiate 6 sine t? That is going to differentiate to 6 cos of t. So then we can take these equations here and substitute these into our integral here. So just doing that, we'll then have that, leaving our integral in terms of the limits t2 and t1, we'll have 6 cos of t, and we're going to multiply that by 5 sine of 2t, and we're still integrating with respect to t. And then we can say next that this will remain the same, t2, t1, and we can multiply the two constants 6 and 5 together. So that will leave us with 30 lots of cos of t multiplied by sine of 2t. So you may recall we have the following trig identity where we have that sine of 2t is going to be equal to 2 lots of sine t multiplied by cos of t. So what we'll do here is we'll use this trig equation and substitute this into our integral here. So continuing this on, our integral limits remain the same, and we're now going to have 30 lots of cos of t multiplied by 2 sine t multiplied by cos of t. And then moving along to the side now, we can uh, multiply this into something which looks quite similar to what we're after, where our limits again remain the same. We this time have constants 30 and 2. So we can multiply them together, which gives us 60 
and we then have cos of t multiplied by cos of t which will give us cos squared t and then we still have our sine t and then looking back at the question this is exactly what we were after and then we have here that therefore our limits we have that t1 is going to be equal to 0 and t2 is going to be equal to pi over 2 so how do we know this we know this from the question where we're given the range of t values here so therefore we have our limits and what we can then say is that the region r is going to be equal to the integral of pi over 2 and 0 and we have 60 and then we're going to swap around the cos and the sine here just because that's what the question asks us to show so we'll have 60 multiplied by sine t multiplied by cos square t and we're integrating with respect to t so therefore we've completed this question as we have shown the required form of the integral this question was worth three marks and we're going to take a look and see where we picked up our marks so we receive our first mark when we got our integral into this form here so that was saying we knew how to use this formula here and by substituting our values which included differentiating our parametric equation x and then receive our second mark for when we had the integral correct and we just had to put in our limits and then we receive our third and final mark for identifying the limits correctly and concluding with the required result. So in the second part of part A of this question, we're asked to show by algebraic integration that the area of R is exactly 20. So essentially what we're being asked to do here is to take our integral from part A and we're to use our knowledge of integration to solve this. So the first step we're going to make here is we're going to pull out 60, our constant, from the integral so you can see we have 60 here and we can pull it out so we're going to have 60 and we're going to multiply it by our integral our limits stay the same and what else we can do well we'll have then sine t but to make this simpler we want to make this cos t into something which is in terms of sine 2 so we know that cos squared of t is going to be equal to 1 minus sine squared t so what we can do is we can substitute this in and we use brackets so we'll have 1 minus sine squared t dt so then this is going to be equal to 60 and our integral stays the same pi over 2 so our limits remain and then we'll have sine t multiplied by 1 which is sine t and we're going to subtract sine t multiplied by sine t squared and that is going to be equal to sine cubed t integrating with respect to t. So just as a side note here, we can then do our kind of sub integral. So we'll have that sine t with respect to t is going to integrate to negative cos of t. Then we would have a constant. And likewise, we'll have the uh, negative sine cubed t integrated with respect to dt is going to be equal to positive cos t and we subtract 1 over 3 lots of cos cubed t and then we have a constant of integration also but remember we don't actually need to include the constant of integration in here because we're going to be evaluating it directly using the limits so this means we're going to have 60 lots of so what we do actually see is we have a negative cos t and a positive cos t, so they'll cancel out, which is going to leave us with negative 1 over 3 cos cubed t. And then what we'll do is we'll have pi over 2 and 0. So then what is this going to equal? So we'll have 60 multiplied by negative 1 over 3 cos cubed pi over 2 and then we'll subtract negative 1 over 3 cos cubed 0 and then we'll close these brackets here so we therefore have a value in this that r is going to be equal to 60 and we multiply this by negative 1 over 3 cos cubed pi over 2 which is equal to 0 and then we're going to have that when we substitute 0 in here that is going to give us negative 1 over 3 
so we subtract negative 1 over 3. So we actually have that then r is going to be equal to 60 lots of 1 over 3, which is going to be equal to 20. And that is the answer the question asked for. So we'll then write in as required. So looking back, this question was worth three marks. And we achieved our first mark when we got our uh, integral into a form where we could integrate. So that was at this point here that we'll get this mark. We then receive our second mark for integrating correctly. Then we receive our third and final mark for then using the limits correctly and concluding with the correct answer, which was showing that r was equal to 20 units. So in the next part of this question, we're given some further information, including this diagram, figure four. We're told that part of the curve is used to model the profile of a small dam. And that's shown in the figure. And using the model, and given that we're told that x and y are both in metres, we're told that the vertical wall of the dam is 4.2 metres high. So we can see that here, 4.2 metres from the y equals zero to the dam vertical point here. And then we're also told that there's a horizontal walkway of width mn along the top of the dam. And we are asked to calculate the width of the walkway. So I the length from m to n. So to begin with, uh, we're going to have a think about the information we have already. So we know that x is equal to 6 sine t and y is equal to 5 sine 2t. So we know that when y is equal to 4.2, which is the height of the wall, we can find t using this equation for y. So therefore, writing this down, when y is equal to 4.2, we have that 4.2 is equal to 5 lots of sine 2t. So therefore, we can say, rearranging this, we can say that sine 2t is equal to 4.2 over 5, and then we can find 2t by doing sine negative 1 of 4.2 over 5, and then we can find t by taking this value and dividing it by 2. So we put this into our calculator, sine negative 1 of 4.2 over 5, and we divide by 2. And this gives us that t is going to be equal to 0 0.49865 and so on. So therefore we use our knowledge of cast diagrams. And here we're working in radians. So we have all in sine. So we need to work back this way. So we also have, and our second t value, so we'll say that this is t1. And we have that t2 is going to be equal to well, we'll have pi minus, now we need to multiply it by 2 this time because we were originally had 2t. So pi minus 2 lots of t1, which is going to be equal to pi minus 2 times 0 0.49865, which is equal to 1.0721. 1 so therefore we have one value of t and we have our second value of t here. So now we can use these two values of t to find values of x. So therefore we have that x1 is going to be equal to, well we have our equation of x here. So it's going to be 6 sine lots of t1 and we know that t1 is equal to 0 0.49865 and putting this into our calculator this comes out as 2.869 rounded to three decimal places and we also have that x2 is going to be equal to six sine lots of our value t2 which is equal to 1.0721 and again putting this into our calculator this comes out as 5.269 and that's the three decimal places as well so from this, we can work out the width of the path. So we can write here that the width of the path is going to be, well, what is it going to be? So it's going to be the difference between x2 and x1. So I'll have x2 minus x1, which is equal to 5.269 minus 2.869, which is equal to 
2.40 meters. So therefore we've found the width of the path and it's going to be 2.4 meters and we've completed this question. There was five marks available here and we achieved our first mark when we got to this stage here where we had sine 2t was equal to 4.2 over 5. We then achieve our second mark for getting both our values of t1 and t2. We receive our third mark for attempting to find the x values of both t values. So we'll give our third mark for the attempt to find the values of x here. And then we receive our fourth mark for having correct values of x. So we'll write that in there. And then we receive our fifth and final mark for being able to work out the width by doing x2 minus x1 and concluding correctly that the answer was 2.4 meters. So in this question, we're told that the function g is defined as follows. So we have that g of x is equal to 3 lin x minus 7 divided by lin of x minus 2. And we're told two key pieces of information, that x is greater than 0 and that x is not equal to k, where k is a constant. So in part A of this question, we're asked to deduce the value of k. So we need to have a think, what cannot k be? So we know that when we have a fraction, the denominator cannot equal zero. So therefore, what this means is our denominator cannot equal zero either. So from this, we can work out what value x cannot be for the denominator to not be zero. So therefore, to do this, we'll say lin of x minus two We'll set that equal to zero, and we want to solve this, so we want to rearrange this so we find x. So therefore, we can add two to both sides, so we'll have that when x is equal to two, and then we want to isolate this value of x here. So we can do that by taking the exponential of both sides. So we take the exponential of lin of x, and we take the exponential of two, and then therefore this cancels out here on the left hand side so we'll have the x is going to be equal to e of 2. So therefore from here we can say that the value of k is going to be equal to e to the power of 2. Or another way we could write this, we could write it in the form we're given here, x is not equal to e 2. So therefore we have achieved one mark here for concluding with the correct answer. And that was that k was equal to e to the 2. So in this question, we're asked to prove that g dash of x, so the derivative of the function g, is greater than 0. And we're asked to do this for all values of x in the domain of g. So an important part of this question is going to be the quotient rule. So if we have a function where we have a fraction, so we have f of x as our numerator and h of x as our denominator, then we can say that the derivative of this so g dash x is going to be equal to the derivative of the numerator multiplied by the denominator. And then we'll subtract the numerator of g of x and multiply it by the derivative of the denominator. And then we divide all of this by h of x, which is our denominator of the original function g of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to recall that from part a of the question, we have what we're given. So we're told that g of x was equal to 3 lin of x minus 7 and we divide this by lin x minus 2. So therefore we're going to let f of x equal our numerator. So we have that f of x is equal to 3 lin x minus 7 and likewise we're going to say that h of x is going to be equal to lin of x minus 2. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to differentiate both of these. So we'll have the f dash x is going to be, so how do we differentiate lin x? So we have that lin x is going to differentiate to 1 over x. So therefore here it is going to differentiate to 3 over x. And likewise for h of x, we'll have that the derivative of h of x is going to be equal to lin x. Differentiate that, that's going to be 1 over x. And again, our constant value differentiates to nothing. So the next stage is going to be to take these values and plug them into this formula here. So therefore, what we can say, we can say that g dash x, so the derivative of g of x, is going to be equal to, so we'll take f dash x, so we'll have 3 over x, and we're going to multiply that 
by h of x, which is lin of x minus 2. And then we're going to subtract the derivative of h, that's going to be 1 over x. And we're going to multiply that by f of x, which is 3 lin of x minus 7. Then we need to remember and divide all of this by h of x squared, which is going to be lin of x minus 2. And we add in our squared term there. So now we're going to look to simplify this slightly. So we'll just expand the brackets out and we'll have 3 over x multiplied by lin of x. Then we're going to subtract 3 over x multiplied by negative 2, which is going to be 6 over x. And then we'll subtract 1 over x multiplied by 3 lin x. So that's going to be 3 lin x. And then we're going to divide that by x. And then we multiply negative 1 over x by negative 7. So we have a positive 7 over x. Then we got to remember and divide this all by our denominator, which is lin x minus 2, all squared. So we're then going to slightly simplify this. We can see that we have 3 lin x over x and negative 3 lin x over x, so they cancel out. And then we have 7 over x minus 6 over x, as you can see here and here. So that leaves us with 1 over x. So therefore, we have 1 over x, and then our denominator stays the same. It's lin x minus 2, and we square that. So then we can therefore simplify this further by bringing this x term here down into the denominator. So therefore, we can conclude that the derivative of g of x, g dash x, is going to be equal to 1. And we're going to divide that by x, and we're going to multiply that by lin x minus 2 all squared. So we look back to the question and we were asked to prove that g dash x was greater than zero for all values of x in the domain of g. So we noticed two things here. So we know that x is always greater than zero and then we also know that our other term is squared. So we have that lin x minus 2 is squared. So therefore, from this, we can conclude that the denominator is always positive, and thus g dash x will always be positive. And therefore, we've completed this question. So there was three marks on offer, and we receive our first mark for attempting to differentiate using the quotient rule. So we'll give ourselves the first mark at this stage here. We then receive the second mark for differentiating correctly. And we then receive the third and final mark for having this concluding statement about why the derivative of g of x is always positive, and therefore we've completed this question. So here in this question, we're asked to find the range of values of a for which we have that g of a is greater than zero. So we recall from the previous parts of the question that we are given that the function g of x is equal to 3 lin x minus 7 divided by lin x minus 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve this and make it like an inequality to be able to deduce the values of a of which g of a is greater than zero. So what we're going to do first is we're going to let lin of x equal y, and this will make things slightly more straightforward to begin with. So then we have that g of x is going to be equal to 3y minus 7, and then we divide that by y minus 2, and we know that this is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And this is now the inequality that we want to work with. So firstly, if we multiply both sides by y minus 2, so this means that the denominator will disappear or effectively turn to 1 on the left-hand side, and we multiply y minus 2 by 0 on the right-hand side, so therefore that is equal to 0. So therefore we have that 3y minus 7 is greater than 0. So we can now rearrange this and solve for y, so we'll add 7 to both sides, which leaves us with 3y is greater than 7, and then we can divide by 3 to give us the fact that y is going to be greater than 7 over 3. So therefore we replace y with lin of x, so we can say that lin of x is greater than 7 over 3, and now we want to work in terms of a, so we'll just write in brackets, we change x to a, so what we can do now is we can take the exponentials of both sides, which is going to leave us with 
a is going to be greater than e to the power of 7 over 3. And secondly, we notice that we have y minus 2 as our denominator. So we know that if y is equal to 2, then g of x is not going to be defined because the denominator is equal to 0. So therefore, what we can say now is that for this whole function to work, we must have that y is going to be less than or equal to 2, which therefore means that lin of a, so we'll just put a in straight away this time, that is going to have to be less than 2. So therefore, taking exponentials, we have that a must be less than e to the power of 2. We also know that our value of a, so we're told in part in the first part of the question that x is greater than 0. So since effectively a is now x, this means that we know that a is going to be greater than 0. So this means that this value of a must be between 0 and e to the power of 2. So we can therefore write that 0 is less than a, which is less than e2. And we can also take in a result from above, and we also have that a is going to be greater than e to the power of 7 over 3. And therefore, we have shown the range of values for which g of a is greater than 0, and we've completed this question. So there was two marks available in this question, and we achieve our first mark for attempting to solve this using inequalities. So that was at this stage here, where we started showing our use of inequalities. And we then received our second mark for concluding with the correct answer, which was that, firstly, a is between 0 and e to the power of 2, and secondly, that a is greater than e to the power of 7 over 3. And therefore, we've completed this question. So in this question, we're told that a circle C has a radius R, and it lies in only the first quadrant, and it touches the x-axis and touches the y-axis. We're told that we also have a line L, and it has the equation 2x plus y is equal to 12. And in this question, we're asked to show that the x-coordinates of the points of intersection of our line L with our circle C satisfy the following equation. That is 5x squared plus 2r minus 48, lots of x, plus r squared minus 24r plus 144, and that is equal to 0. So firstly, we'll just take a look and have a think about what these two bullet points mean. So here we have a kind of diagram here. So this is our x-axis and our y-axis. So we know the first quadrant is this. So we know that the circle only lies here, and we know that it's going to touch the x-axis here and the y-axis here. So we know our circle will look something, not exactly, but it'll look something like this. So we now need to have a think, what will this take equation of the form? So we know that the standard equation of a circle will be, so we'll just put a C in here, but we know that the standard equation of a circle will be here, this sort of thing, where the center is zero. So we know that for our circle, the center will have been shifted up from here to here. So this means to find the center, it's going to be shifted by the radius along the x-axis and by the radius on the y-axis. So therefore, we'll just write this down. So the center of the circle is shifted by r units along the x-axis and the y-axis. So therefore, we can say that the equation of c will be as follows. From the general form of the equation of a circle, we'll have x minus r, we'll square that, then we'll add on y minus r, and we'll square that too, and we know that that is going to be equal to the radius squared. And then we know our equation L, so it has the equation, I'll we'll just write in here, 2x, and then we're going to add y, and that's equal to 12, so we're given that in the equation, so we're given that in the question here, so we rearrange that, and we can say that y is going to be equal to 12 minus 2x. So this means we can now be ready to move forward with the question. So what we want to do is we want to take this equation here and substitute it into this equation here. But to do that, we'll need to simplify this equation for the circle slightly first. So we'll just continue working down here and we're going to expand our brackets. So x minus r squared, that is going to give us x squared, and then we're going to subtract two lots of r multiplied by x, and then we're going to add on r squared. Likewise, for the y minus r squared, we'll have 
that will add on y squared and we'll subtract two lots of r multiplied by y and then we'll add on r squared also and that is equal to r squared so if we can just tidy this up slightly so we can see that we have an r squared here an r squared there and an r squared there so we can simplify this and add these two r squared together and then subtract r squared and this will give us that the other equation is equal to zero so we'll therefore have x squared plus y squared so i'll just rearrange it slightly so both our squared times are at the front and we'll subtract two lots of r x and two lots of r y and like i said we have two r squared minus r squared which leaves us with r squared and the other side is not equal to zero so what we can do now is we can substitute this in so i'll just write that in here we'll substitute this in so then we're just going to do this as follows so our x squared stays the same our y squared we're now going to have plus 12 minus 2x and we square that and we're going to subtract two lots of rx then we see another y term here so we know we'll just scratch down there where two y terms are so then this time we're going to subtract two lots of r but we're going to multiply it by 12 minus 2x and then we add on r squared and that's all equal to zero so as you can see we've basically eliminated all of the y's in this equation and we now have all in terms of the x and r's so our next stage here is going to be to expand this bracket here and also we'll deal with this bracket here as well so we'll have now so we'll x squared will stay the same and then we have 12 times 12 which is 144 and then we'll have uh, 12 multiplied by negative 2x and we'll have two lots of that so that's two lots of negative 24x which is uh, negative 48x and then we'll have a positive 4x squared and then continuing on we'll have take away two lots of rx then we're going to minus 2r multiplied by 12 which is 24 lots of r and then we'll have 2 negative 2r multiplied by negative 2x so that is going to give us a positive since we're multiplying two negatives and it's going to be 4rx and then we'll still have this r squared on the end so now we can simplify this by collating all the like terms so firstly we have an x squared and a 4x squared so that's going to give us 5x squared then taking a look at all our terms which have an x we're going to have negative 48x we'll keep that on its own for just now and then we're also we have negative 2 lots of r of x and 4rx so combining them together we have 4 minus 2 so we have remaining positive 2rx and then from here the rest of it remains the same and that we have positive r squared and then another term in terms of r we have negative 24r and then finally the constant on the end will have 144 and this all still remains equal to zero so all i've done here is collate the like terms and made this into a slightly simpler uh, form so now we can look back to the question we're getting quite close to what we wanted so we have we have our 5x squared so we'll just give that a little tick here and if we put brackets in here we have our r squared minus 24r plus 144 so we'll tick that so we just need to now look and see what we can do to go from negative 48x plus 2rx to 2r minus 48 lots of x so we see we can take out the common factor of x here so therefore this is going to give us the required answer that we're asked for so we have our 5x squared that remains the same so then now what do we do well we want to take x out as a common factor so that is going to leave us with 2r minus 48 we multiply it by x and then we have our term r squared minus 24r plus 144 and to be like it's in the question we'll pop our brackets in there and that's all equal to zero and that is the answer that the question asks for so we'll write in as required therefore we have completed this question and i'll now go over where we picked up our marks so we pick up our first of three marks for uh, deducing the correct equation of the circle so that was when we knew to shift the circle by r units 
along the x and y axis which gave us the center of the circle. So we pick up our first mark here when we got the correct equation of the circle. We then get our second mark for attempting to form an equation with the terms x squared, x and r squared. So where is this? This is at the point here where we start to substitute in our y equals 12 minus 2x equation. So we'll give ourselves this second mark just about here. And then we receive our third and final mark for concluding with the correct answer. And that was the answer that the question asked for, which we've shown here. So in the next part of the question, we're given some further information and we're told that L is a tangent line to C. So basically, what does this mean? So if we have a circle like this, then if L is a tangent, then this means that L will touch C at this point here, for example. So we're asked to find the two possible values for R and we're to give our answers as fully simplified thirds. So we know that if we have a tangent line, then we have one repeated root, which means that the discriminant will be equal to zero. So this is our equation for the discriminant here. That is b squared minus 4ac, and we know it's going to be equal to zero since we have one repeated root. So I'll just note in here that this is the discriminant. And we recall from part a the following. We have that 5x squared plus 2r minus 48 lots of x plus r squared minus 24r plus 144 is equal to zero. So we see this is a quadratic equation and we have coefficients in front of the x squared, the x term, and then three of the coefficient x2. So this means that we can say that we have that a is equal to five, we have that b is equal to two r minus 48, and finally we have that c is equal to r squared minus 24r plus 144. So we can substitute these in to our equation for the discriminant. So therefore, we have b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0. And just carrying this along here, we have that b squared is 2r minus 48 squared. And then we're going to take away 4 lots of a, which is 5. And we're going to multiply this by c, which is r squared minus 24r and we add on 144. And we know that this is all still going to be equal to zero, and we now effectively want to solve for r. So we do this first by doing a bit of simplification. So we expand this first bracket, and what does this give us? So this gives us 4r squared, and then we'll have negative 192r. So this comes from 2r multiplied by 48 and then we have two lots of that and then we're going to have 48 squared which is 2304 and then for this rest of the equation we have that negative 4 times 5 is going to be 20 so we're then going to have negative 20 multiplied by this bracket so that's going to be negative 20r squared then we have negative 20 multiplied by negative 24 which is positive 480, lots of r that is, and then we have negative 20 times 144, which is negative 2880, and that still is all equal to zero. So we're now gonna simplify things a little bit further by collecting our like terms. So we have 4r squared minus 20r squared, which is negative 16r squared, and then the, for the r terms, we have 192. So we can see we have that here and 480. So we have 480 minus 192, which leaves us with positive 288r. And then for the constant terms, this leaves us with 576 here. And that's all still equal to zero. So to make this easy to solve, we can divide everything by 16 or negative 16. So we divide by negative 16. So therefore, this is going to leave us with r squared. And then 288 divided by negative 16 comes out as negative 18. We have r. And then finally, we have the constant is going to be 576 divided by negative 16, which is 36. And this is equal to zero. So now we'll use the quadratic formula. So we'll just write in quadratic formula. And we'll have that this time a is equal to 1, b is equal to negative 18, and c is equal to 36. So therefore, we'll have our value of r is going to be equal to 
negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac. We square root that and then we divide it by two lots of a. So then summing our values in, we have negative negative 18, which is 18. And we're going to add on negative 18 squared. Then we subtract four lots of, of what's a. So a is 1. So we'll just put that in. And then c is 36. And then we put our square root in here and we divide everything by 2 lots of a, which is 2. So I'm simplifying this here. This comes out as 18 plus or minus 6 multiplied by the square root of 5. And 2 is the denominator still. So just to note, how do we go from here to here? So we kept our 18 and our 2, and we put the things inside the square root uh, into the calculator. So in simplifying this, we can divide everything by 2. So therefore, we can conclude that r is equal to 9 plus or minus. So we have the 6 root 5 divided by 2 is equal to 3 lots of root 5. And that there is our answer. And we finished this question and concluded that the two possible values for r are going to be 9 plus 3 root 5 and 9 minus 3 root 5. So now to just take a look and see where we got our marks for this question. We received our first mark for attempting to use the discriminant to begin to find the roots. So we will give ourselves this mark when we uh, substitute in our values just about here and when we kind of started with the, the finding the roots process. We then achieve our second mark for getting a correct quadratic equation in R. So we did that when we got to this point here. And it doesn't actually matter. You would still get the marks if you left it at this stage here. But I thought it would be good to simplify it to make the next stage slightly simpler. We then pick up our third mark for uh, having a correct attempt to solve our equation for R. So this was when we started to use the quadratic formula and substitute the values in. So we'll give ourselves this mark here. And then we received our fourth and final mark for concluding with the correct answer and that we showed that we worked accurately and we gave our answer correctly um, and left it in third form like the question asked for. So in this question, we're told that we have a geometric series and it has a common ratio of r, and its first term is a. We're told that the common ratio r is not equal to 1, and that a is not equal to 0. And we're asked here to prove that s of n, so the sum of n terms of our geometric series, is equal to a multiplied by 1 minus r to the power of n, all divided by 1 minus r. So just to start, we will have a think, what is Sn going to be? So we'll write Sn, so we know it is going to be the sum of all the terms. So we're going to just write this out in full, and then we can work with it from there. So we know that our first term is A, so we'll write A down, and then to get the sum of our first two terms, we're going to add in the second term. So what is this? We have a common ratio of R, so it's going to be the initial term A multiplied by R, because that's our common ratio, and then we're going to then have our, say, our third term, that's going to be a, then this time we multiply by r again, so we have a r squared, and then we have a r cubed, a r to the power of 4, and so on, and we have, uh, this goes all the way to a multiplied by r, n minus 1. So we stop it at n minus 1 here, and that's the final term of our geometric series. And that's because we're summing up the first n terms. So, for example, we have 1, 2, 3, and so on. And this is our nth term here. So, that's the sum of our nth terms. So, what we're going to do now, just to manipulate it, we're going to multiply both sides by r. So, we'll just write in times r times r here. So, therefore, what does this give us? This is going to give us r multiplied by sn. And that's going to be equal to, well, we'll multiply each term here by r. So we'll have the a turns into an a r, the a r turns into an a r squared, and then our third term is going to be a r cubed. And then we add on all the way up to a to the power of r, and this time we're going to have one extra r effectively. So it's going to be a r 
to the power of n instead of n minus 1. So the next step is we want to find the difference between this equation here and this equation here. So we'll have the sum of our n terms and we'll subtract r multiplied by the sum of n terms. So this is going to be equal to, well, we'll have our a plus a r plus a r squared plus everything all the way to a r n minus 1. And then we're going to subtract all of these terms from this equation here. So we'll have negative a r negative a r squared and then we'll subtract everything all the way up to a r to the power of n so we now need to have a think what terms cancel out here so we see we have an a here but we have no a on the other side but then we have an a r and a negative a r we have an a r squared and a negative a r squared we have an a r n minus one and in here we'll also have an a r n minus one so this means this is going to leave us with only this. So we'll have our a here. So I'll just highlight that in yellow. And then it's also going to leave us with negative a r to the power of n. Because as we know, the n sum ends at a r n minus 1, which leaves this term here also. So therefore, we can write this in a simpler form. So the n sum minus the r multiplied by the n sum is going to be equal to well, we have a, and we're going to subtract a r to the power of n. So then now, what we want to do is we want to take this equation here, and we want to rearrange it to get this equation here. So I'll just write that in. So we now want to rearrange to get the required answer. So what we're going to do, well, we're first we're going to take a look at this left-hand side. We're going to take a common factor of s of n out. So the, the n sum will take a common factor of that out. So that's going to leave us with the n sum. Then we'll have 1 minus r. And this is going to be equal to, well, what can we do on the other side? We can take a common factor of a out. So it's going to leave us with a lots of 1 minus r to the power of n. So in the next stage here, we can see this is very much getting into where we want it to be. So then we're going to divide both sides by well, 1 minus r, and this will leave us with, so we'll have the nth sum of our geometric series is going to be equal to what's our right-hand side, so it's a lots of 1 minus r to the power of n. And then we now are saying we'll divide everything by 1 minus r, and that gives us the required answer, which we were after in the question. So we'll just write in as required and therefore, we have completed this question and we've proved that the sum from the first n terms of our geometric series is going to be a lots of 1 minus r to the power of n, all divided by 1 minus r. So where did we pick up our marks? So we received our first mark for uh, writing out the sum. So that's when we wrote out our list of terms here. So that's our first mark we achieved there. We then achieve our second mark for knowing to multiply the sum by r. So that was at this stage here. This was a key stage which helped us move forward with the problem. We then receive our third mark for writing those terms out and simplifying it to get to this stage here. That was when we had the, the n sum minus the r multiplied by the n sum was equal to a minus a to the power of rn. So essentially from the, here to here we get this mark for cancelling out these terms and we then receive our fourth and final mark for concluding with the correct answer and that was the answer of which we wanted to prove in the question. So in this part of the question we're given some further information and we're told that the sum of the first 10 terms is four times the sum of the first five terms and we are asked to find the exact value of r. And we also want to bear in mind that we've proved in part a that the nth sum is equal to a lots of 1 minus r to the power of n over 1 minus r. So what we're going to do here is we're going to write out what we're told in the question. And that's how we're going to start things off. So therefore, what we can say is that the sum of 10 terms is equal to 4 lots of the sum of 5 terms. So as you can see, we have s10 is equal to 4 multiplied by s of 5. So what we can do now is we can replace 
this here as a 10 with this equation here where we replace n with 10 on the left hand side and n with 5 on the right hand side. So therefore what we can say is that a lot of 1 minus r to the power of 10 divided by 1 minus r is going to be equal to 4 lots of a multiplied by 1 minus r to the power of 5 and then we're going to divide all of this by 1 minus r. So what we're going to do now is we're going to essentially rearrange this equation and we want to solve for r. So there are a few things which is going to make this slightly easier. So we see that we can divide both sides by a and this a will cancel out and this a will cancel out. So we'll just put in here, divide by a. And then what else can we do? So we notice that we have 1 minus r on both denominators. So if we multiply both sides by 1 minus r, like this, this is going to cancel them out and therefore going to leave us with the following. So we'll have on the left hand side, so as I said, the a cancels and the 1 minus r on the denominator will cancel. So that's going to leave us with 1 minus r to the power of 10. And the same on the other side, the a and the 1 minus r cancel out. So that's going to leave us with 4 lots of 1 minus r to the power of 5. So then what we're going to do now is we're going to tidy this up a little bit. And just working along the way here, we are going to expand the brackets on the right-hand side. So we're going to have 1 minus r to the power of 10. And that's going to be 4 minus 4 lots of r to the power of 5. So then we're going to once again rearrange this. So... We want to turn this into something which looks similar to quadratic. So if we rearrange this, we'll add r to the power of 10 to both sides. So we'll have r to the power of 10. And then we take away 4r to the power of 5. And then, so essentially we're moving everything to the right hand side here. Uh, so that means we have 4 and then we want to get this 1 to the other side. So we subtract 1 and that's going to leave us with positive 3. And that's all equal to zero now. Apart from what I've done is I've just written it out on the left hand side, even though we've moved everything to the right hand side, and it's equal to zero. So either way, it doesn't really matter there. Then what I want to do now is I want to solve this for r, but this is slightly tricky. So what I'm going to say is then what we're going to do is we're going to then let x equal r to the power of five. And then that means x squared is going to be equal to r to the power of 10. So therefore, this is going to make it easier to solve. So we substitute our values of x in. So we'll have x squared. And then we're going to subtract 4 lots of x. And then we have our constant 3 on the end. And that's equal to 0. So we now have a quadratic, which is much easier to solve. This is much easier to solve compared to this. So what we can do is we can factorize this, and this is going to give us x minus 3 and x minus 1. And we know this is right because we can check our answers by multiplying it out. So x squared, and then we'll have minus 3x and minus x, which is minus 4x. And then we have negative 3 multiplied by negative 1, which is 3 here. So therefore, what we can say now is we can substitute our r values back in. So r5 minus 3, is that like that, and r5 minus 1 is equal to 0. So therefore, next stage here, we'll now write these out explicitly, our values for r. So from this first bracket here, that's going to give us that r to the power of 5 is going to be equal to, well, we add 3 to both sides, which leaves us with 3. Um, and what we want to do to isolate r is to take the fifth root, um, which is going to leave us with the fifth root of 3. And then we'll deal with our other r. So I'll just put an arrow here, and then we're going to have r5 is going to be equal to 1, which implies that r is going to be equal to the fifth root of 1, which is 1. But we're told in the question that r cannot equal 1. So we'll just write in here, but this solution isn't valid since r cannot equal 1. So therefore, this leaves us with our solution, fifth root of 3. So we'll just write that in. So therefore, the exact value of r, and we know that it asks us for the exact value. So this means that we'll leave our answer in this square root symbol form. 
So the exact value of r is going to be such that r is equal to the fifth root of three. And there we go, we've completed this question. And now we're gonna take a look and see where we achieved the marks. So there was four marks on offer. And we do achieve our first mark for uh, having the correct strategy and producing an equation which had R10 and R5 in it. So that was at this stage here where we achieved this first mark. And then we receive our second mark for working through the next stage. So knowing that things cancel out and getting to this point here where we had the kind of one line equation, so to speak, with no fractions. And we then receive the next mark for uh, following through with this work um, and doing the correct algebra, which was when we did all of this work here and solved for R. So that was essentially at this stage here. And then we received the fourth and final mark for omitting the R equals one solution and concluding that the only exact value of R was the fifth root of three. And therefore we've completed this question. So here in this question, we're asked to use algebra to prove that the square of any natural number is either a multiple of three or is one more than a multiple of three. So we know that we're going to be dealing with the value three. So we know that any natural number can be written in the form of something to do with 3k. So for example, we'll have that any natural number can be written like this, so 3k. And then it can also be written as 3k plus 1, because we can add 1 to it. And then it can also be written as 3k plus 2. And then essentially we could write it as 3k plus 3, but that's just going to bring us back round to the same value as 3k. So we'll just write that in here. We can express natural numbers in this form. And to prove what we want to prove here, we're going to work with... 3k, 3k plus 1, and 3k plus 2 to show that we're going to have the square of that is either a multiple of 3 or 1 more than a multiple of 3. Okay, so to begin with, we'll work on the 3k case. So initially, what we'll have is we'll have 3k all squared, and that is going to be equal to, well, 3 squared is 9, and then k squared, so we'll have 9k squared. And bear in mind, we want to see if this is a multiple of 3 or 1 more than a multiple of 3. So we need to think, is there any other way we can write 9k squared? Well, we can because 9 is equal to 3 times 3. So this is going to be written as 3 times 3 lots of k squared. And what's this? Well, this is a multiple of 3. So that's the first case completed. So we're going to look at the second case. So we'll have 3k plus 1. Just underline that there. So we'll square again, 3k plus 1, and we'll square it. So what's that going to be equal to? It? Well, we'll just write out our working here. So 3k plus 1 multiplied by 3k plus 1. So our first term will be of 3k times 3k, which is 9k squared. And then we'll have 3k plus 3k, which is equal to 6k. And then our constant on the end will be 1. So we need to have a think, what can we do here? How can we rewrite this? So what do we see? We see that these two values here are multiples of 3. And then we have a constant 1 on the end. So we'll take out our common factor of 3 from these highlighted terms. So we'll have 3 lots of 3k squared plus 2k. And then we're going to add on our constant 1 to that. So what do we have here? We have a multiple of 3 and we add 1 on which is again part of the criteria we're looking for. So we can see that this is, so we'll just write that in. So we have three lots of 3k squared plus 2k. And what's that? Well, that is gonna be one more than a multiple of three, which again, ticks the boxes that we're looking for here. And then what we want to do is we wanna take a look at this final case here. So that's gonna be the 3k plus 2 case. So once again, we're going to square this. So I'll just write this in here, 3k plus 2, and we square it. So just write your working out. We'll just copy it out here. And then we have this time, we're going to have 3 times 3 again, which is 9. And then we're going to have k squared. 
then this time it's going to be 3k times 2 plus 3k times 2 which is 12k and then finally our constant is this time going to be 4 as opposed to 1 so just like this so we need to have a think what can we do to simplify this so we want to look for a multiple of 3 so we'll take a common factor of 3 out so here we'll have 3 and it, we're going to multiply it and it's going to be 3 multiplied by 3k squared because that gives us 9k squared and then how do we get to 12k well what we'll have is we'll add on 4 lots of k since 3 times 4 is 12 and then we need to have a think so we're looking to make it 1 more than a multiple of 3 and we know that if we put a 1 in our factorization here we can then add one on to the end and we'll have our terms here and then we'll have three multiplied by three plus one which is four so therefore what we've written this as we've written it in the form of once again one more than a multiple of three because we notice we have our three here and we're adding one on to the end and we'll just write that down which is also one more than a multiple of three so therefore what we've done is we've worked through all three of these cases where we've now been able to prove that for any value that k takes, so for any natural number, it's always going to be a multiple of 3 or it's going to be one more than a multiple of 3. And we've shown that here by squaring everything and then factorising it and bringing it into a simpler form. So now what we can do is we can just write a little concluding statement which relates back to the question. So therefore, we have shown that the square of any natural number is either a multiple of 3 or 1 more than a multiple of 3. And therefore, we've completed this question. There was four marks on offer. So we achieve our first mark for attempting to square any two distinct cases of the three cases that we've identified here. So we start, we attempt to square our second one just about here. So we'll give ourselves our first mark here. And we then receive our second mark for having the accurate results and making a valid comment for any two of the three cases we have. So we do this at this stage here and we then make a comment and do it at the second stage here. So we'll therefore give ourselves our second mark at this stage here. And then we pick up our third mark for attempting to do the square but for all three cases. So we'll just pop that third mark in here and then we receive our fourth and final mark for accurately doing and commenting on all three cases and giving a minimal conclusion which is where here we've related things back to the question so we'll pop in our fourth and final mark at this end stage here and therefore we've completed this question